Well, there is an on switch. To Howdy, the, Steve. Well, 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 oh, it's just turned off. Oh, Heather just dropped a bunch of those off for everybody. Was very nice. Thank you. No signal out. I'm here. Well, it wasn't very pushy. I just sort of put my hand in. <laughs> sense that. No, there was. I didn't feel that. These are the attorney spots for ordinary meetings. What are you busy? That's why they have this off. Yeah, Anthony will call. Oh, they're looking at the go ahead and answer your code. I was at the far end last time. Says your phone is on. I'll call up Wayne's name and then you can answer. Get your your for him and then to just let everybody know what your name is. Because we're now on video. Okay, are we all set? Okay, it is 8 after 1 o'clock. I want to welcome everybody. We'll go ahead and get started with the uh, uh, May 2nd uh, TAC meeting. All right, first item in the agenda, I'll call everyone to order. I'll go ahead and uh, say names. Please let me know if you are here. Eddie Teasdale. Here. Wade Major. Anthony Brown, sitting in for Wade Major. Thank you, Anthony. Welcome. Don Quist. Here. Don Decker. Present. Earl Wilson. Here. Myself, Adam Bingham, I am here. Tim Parker. Here. Stephen Bork. Here. Michelle Anderson is unable to attend today. And Scott Neal. Oh, Neal's here. Okay. We have plenty here present for uh, our meeting. Okay, item number two, public comments. This time is reserved for the public to address the committee about matters not on the agenda. No action will be taken on non-agenda items unless authorized by law. Comments are limited to three minutes per person. Now hand the opportunity over to the public. Okay, no public comments. Back to the committee. We'll go with item number three. The large water resources managers discussion of draft GSP sections and we'll start with basin setting under item a well actually I'll turn it over to you Steve and then you'll start from there. Thank you. Adam. It's on right. Thank you Adam. Um, we have a very exciting agenda for you today. <laughs> <laughs> Why thank you on behalf of all of us. Hi, thank you. I saw Gene. <laughs> um, Gene you're going to start right. Yeah, we've got several items we want to cover. Um, I, I, I have a feeling there's going to be some questions because a lot has actually gone on over the last, probably last month between the last TAC meeting and board meetings. And I think a lot of people have seen some of the correspondence going back on where we're trying to go with the GSP and some of the allocation work with the attorney and stuff. So we're going to try and cover that. Um, we have some really good technical stuff with Gene, uh, uh, the, the ABC, and D is going to be fairly short, but we get down, down to E. I'm going to do E, and um, that might take a little time, depending on other questions we've got. But I think we've got some good stuff, and I think Gene is going to start us, right? Thank you, Gene. That's it? Okay. That's it. Uh, so the first, there will be a few... Um, technical presentations today because the the model runs as Steve said we don't have a new set of model runs to show you the results of today but we uh, are still working forward with some of the technical issues within the basin I wanted to review the uh, data gaps that we are working on uh, this was developed as part of prop one funding so we are uh, working on the the uh, sampling and aquifer testing plans uh, and exactly which wells we're going to be performing this work on. The, uh, just as a reminder, what we said we would do for the Prop 1 funding is that we will uh, collect 10 samples with a sampling rig, which requires purging at least three well volumes out of the well, making sure all the parameters are stabilized. This is a more expensive kind of sampling because we need to get a rig in that actually will uh, set a pump and uh, uh, partially 
what, make sure that we're getting native uh, water when we collect the sample. The other wells that we are planning on doing is up to 20 uh, domestic wells. Currently, we have five domestic wells that have agreed to let us sample. And uh, the next step for us is to go through um, uh, property records and get uh, the other 15 wells that we need to sample. Part of it is setting up a baseline for TDS uh, throughout the basin. So the wells that we're picking, we are um, setting up to be wells that we also collect groundwater levels at. So that, that's the piece that we're working on and that I assume will take us at least a month if not two months because it gets to the contact of people and making sure that they're fine with sampling their well and then the logistics of it is we would not operate anybody's well. They would have to be there to operate their well. So that, that piece is the piece that we're working on right now. Uh, and then uh, there are a number of springs that we are planning on sampling that, that are uh, perennial streams, uh, springs. So that's that TDS general chemistry. We are also um, uh, working, sorry, part of these slides is I can't see the bottom of them. Just FYI, for when you're here, you have to sort of jump over to see the bottom if you use the full screen. Is the isotope sampling, we've uh, contracted with DRI um, using their geochemistry skills to develop, and you will see part of, uh, Jenny will be presenting, she's here today from DRI, she'll be presenting the next section about the isotope sampling and uh, the background data, and then we'll be putting both of those sampling plans together so that when we go to a well, we're collecting all the different samples that we want at one time. So that's progressing. And then aquifer testing, we have uh, met with the CBs yesterday to look at uh, their facilities as far as uh, doing some aquifer testing and met with the Navy about paired uh, wells. Part of historical uh, pumping tests have been uh, like a slug test or something that will only give us a, a simplified K value. But the big question in this basin is the storage. So to have a storage parameter, it requires that there be at least two wells, a pumping well and then a well at a distance, and it's better if there's a couple wells at different distances, so that we can get the storage parameter between the well that's pumping and the well that we're measuring the drawdowns in. So uh, that is uh, being developed as far as which pairs we would actually use, and then, um, then it just becomes a matter of contracting to get those together. The stream gauges and weather stations uh, are still in the permit process. Uh, we are meeting with BLM tomorrow uh, morning. Uh, we also met with them this morning and working on the specifics of uh, what we need to do for each of these uh, stream gauges and um, precip stations. I'll have more to tell next week, uh, next month, because I'll have had the meeting. I can only tell you that we are going to talk about all the ones that we have uh, presented before in the past at previous TAC meetings. Uh, DWR, the, we had a conference call with them mid-month, and they came back with us and said that if they were to drill the well that we requested in El Paso, it would use up their whole budget for all the basins of uh, Southern California, and so they weren't going to be able to do a 2,000-foot well with four posometers. What they came back with, and I still have to get probably with Tim Parker on this, is uh, they, they, what the issue is, is they have a contract with one driller for Southern California, it's Greg Drilling, who cannot drill to 2,000 feet. So Greg has to get a sub. So anytime you go with a subcontractor, then you get your fees put on on top of that. And they need to go with, uh, they recommended going with best drilling who could go to 2,000 feet. With all the added on costs, that well exceeded their budget. And they asked what was important. And right now what they're costing, so it's not approved fully yet for putting in this four posometer well in El Paso, is to drill to 2,000 feet and do the geophysics. 
but their money might only be to put in the two upper posometers. And um, once we get more uh, information on the costs, I'll have a ad, uh, the data gap ad hoc call to discuss if we really want to go forward in this mode for this, like not getting everything that we want and maybe put it on the table for a future year and maybe resubmit for things like um, wells that are in the Indian Wells Valley that need to be deepened or something that is not as much of a budget drain on DWR. We'll, we'll have to talk about it. But anyway, that will uh, need to go through the data gap ad hoc committee. But right now, we're looking at uh, that is uh, the uh, description that I just gave you is is what they're now negotiating, and they don't know if they can even do that much. But that was what it got pared down to from uh, the previous. And then I got your email, Tim, about that it's more than 500 feet away, so then it might not even be useful for SkyTem. Yeah, yeah, that was one of the questions I, I would have, and maybe uh, if we get on the phone with DWR, because it, they may not, they have two different, the headquarters is where the Sky, the whole uh, three, Basin pilot project using aeroelectrical magnetics mm -hmm. is located, and then this is the regional office you're dealing with. And we were approached by the headquarters right. office that they wanted to fund a well to confirm, help confirm the work that was done with aerial electromagnetics. So, right. so, and there may be, I don't know, maybe there's another pot of money there too because they, I don't know. So right. it'd be worth talking about anyway. Right, it would be, to, because if there is some more money and that we could, the value of having all four posometers is you get the, the vertical profile of how groundwater flows throughout that region. And you can't get it by just, okay, you have the sediments, but you want to actually have water level measurements. How is the water behaving within that vertical column? So it, it, it's worth going the full route of what is designed. And the well was designed similar to the USBR wells. USBR well uh, one is fairly close. It was built in the 1990s. Um, and that was a cooperative effort with uh, BLM and the cooperative group. And so we wanted to have a similar well designed the same way. But, but it turns out it's a pretty expensive well using this method of, of payment at the moment. So uh, that's the status of that, and that, that will be ongoing, and I'll report on it next uh, month of where we get to on that. Gina, is this on? Good. Um, I have uh, some questions on schedule and a few questions about the aquifer testing program. Okay. Um, the per current program that you're looking at, is that to do pumping at a well on the naval base, or uh, has a well not been selected? As oh, well? for the aquifer testing? For the aquifer testing. Uh, we wanted to do a few aquifer tests, some on the base and some not. And um, so we're, we're placing where those would be, yes. And what's the schedule you anticipate for implementing those tests? Uh, with the CBs yesterday, they were saying uh, August, probably, mm. for uh, that particular test. Um, in, in the meantime, have, you know, this time of year, um, the city during the winter has certain wells that are idle, that, or anticipate they do, that they bring online as the temperatures warm up and water use locally increases. The same is true for the ag wells during the winter season. Most of them are mm, idle. Right. So is there a potential to maybe move around some transducers and as those wells kick in, we can monitor the response in the observation wells to the to basically, the, the, that pumping will probably start this month. Uh, yes, there is, I mean, there are the data loggers uh, that we've purchased, the, um, and that was part of the Prop 1 funding. Uh, we haven't discussed it with the uh, ag at this point. Uh, we were looking at the map of uh, where we had holes in data, and there are some already done up there, but uh, I could discuss it probably with Eddie and Wade about um, using ag wells. Yeah, that would seem to be at least, you know, an, an inexpensive aqua right. test, essentially, as the wells have been idle for three months now. I don't mm -hmm. know which, whether, I no, can't speak for the city. No, that's a good suggestion. 
Yeah. I'll also remind us of the uh, uh, Well Intel group that is working with the GA, uh, where they're looking at 10 wells, and they are getting those started, and I think some are already running. 12 are up and running. 12 are up and running. Right. So that's definitely data that can be used uh, with this as well. So, as well. Yes. You're done. You're we done. got the pun. Yeah. Okay, just piggybacking on top of that, actually, uh, we talked within the water district uh, about potentially there, there's a couple of wells that may come online uh, during the drier season, and, and there may be some opportunities there as well. So That would, I mean, it would be great in terms of uh, any of the TAC members re making recommendations for wells that they are knowing of and provide that information, and we could coordinate with you in terms of data loggers and timing. And okay, sounds good. Cause that would be great. Big data Thanks. gap we've been talking about for right. months. Yes, this is those, yeah, those K values and just, setting that up. I had a, a question too, just to follow up, and, and maybe it's more of a, a, a an issue or potential issue. So the Kern County Water Agency. Uh, all, their, all the wells they monitor, they don't necessarily have well construction information on. And so uh, I'm just, uh, you know, wondering if you've looked into that or I, I assume you're going to. Uh, in terms uh, yes, of the we have. Um, we've recently received five boxes of well logs from... Um, Eastern Kern County Resource Conservation District uh, binders, and they are organized by township range and section. So uh, Nicole's job will be, she's the one that did the TDS database. Uh, she will be uh, looking through those binders to fill in. Uh, where we're focusing is really on the Kern County Water Agency monitoring wells right. first. I mean, that's where our focus is because if we, we have, we want those uh, the data and well information for those wells exactly. primarily. So that's where she'll focus on those 192 wells. Uh, and as we get them, we've been redacting personal information, but if you go to the IWG, uh, IWVGSP.com website, some of the wells are already posted. So when you go to well information, you click on the well, and that says well information. Some of them actually have PDFs of well logs that we have. So that's where we're putting those well logs with, without personal information on. Right. I, I just want to remind you that we digitized all the well logs we could get our hands on, and they're mm -hmm. a, in a database. So I was just talking to Steve about this earlier, about maybe it's time to sit down with that database and your database and try to figure out how to best optimize the use of those? Right, right. Because we've, we we've also uh, looked through and tried to identify as many Kern County wells uh, as we can that have well construction information associated with That'd be with, great if you yeah. have done that already. We, did, we haven't seen your work yet. Um, right, right. It's, uh, well, we'll talk right, about that right, again. Exactly. It's, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of data and then there's a lot of holes in right. in putting it all together comprehensively. Right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, one comment on the El Paso. Well, I guess um, probably to quote Mick Jagger, you know, you can't always get what you want, <laughs> um, but I would say right. get what you can. Get what you can. <laughs> I know. Um, otherwise, someone else will use that money. Oh yes, that's absolutely <laughs> so true. So say we'll take whatever they can give us at this point. And mm -hmm. Maybe later on we go back and. And fill in those other two yes, levels, yes. If you waver, the next thing you know, someone will have taken that money. Thank you, yes. And given it to a basin not as deserving. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so that is the uh, AI. <laughs> right, the with, a request, with a request of the TAC to contact me about any kinds of wells that are about to go on that we could... Uh, get an aquifer test or an hydraulic properties from. Okay. Thanks. And, and Tim's request to get a coordination call. Tim's request to get a coordination call for the databases. Right. Yeah. Okay. No, I think that's Does good that too. Should develop it together. Right. All right. Good. I'm assuming every member of the TAC heard that. So, okay. Uh, any other comments from the group here on this item? Okay, we'll go to the public. If you have any comments, please come on up.
Judy Decker. <clears throat> I do have a comment. Uh, when the Water District drilled their wells, 18 and 33, they, especially well 18, because it was first in the unknown area at that time, the southwest, they drilled two monitoring wells, I believe at, at different distances from the well. I don't know if those are still in operation, but I would think they would be of valuable use to you. Thank you, Judy. Good afternoon, Elaine Mead. Jean, I have two questions. Um, one is, are you receiving the transducer information from Kern County Water Agency? They... Uh, I have in the past, and I'm waiting for the next, the next round in March. We should be receiving some. Okay. And also, you said that on the um, aquifer quality testing, yeah. that you were going to exchange three times the um, well capacity? The, the four the, so right. when you sample to make sure that at least three well volumes are out is a standard. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do you do that? You calculate how much uh, the borehole is in the water column, so then you get that many gallons, and you make sure that many gallons have come out of the well. Before you sample. Before okay. you take the sample. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Larry Mead, let's clarify that Elaine's question. No offense, Elaine, but <laughs> how are you going to do exchange rate on the Bureau of Rec Wells? How are you going to exchange three to four times the water capacity on the Bureau of Rec Wells? Oh, right. I'm not sampling those wells. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're right. Those small, uh, the two-inch diameter and how to get a pump down there, I couldn't. Figure that one out. That's why. I didn't think you did. Right. So that's why we're. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the USBS wells, those ones won't be used for sampling. Not for the TDS for this. Not for this one. Yeah. Right. We're looking more broadly, and and it's also part of shallow well impacts. So it'll. Gotcha. To find to find better wells that can assist. Okay. Good. For what we're looking at. Good. The Bureau of Weck Wells are cash gem wells. Yes. If you don't do the exchange, you clean the well up. No, I'm. I'll leave this alone. I'll leave this alone. Okay. Yeah. Yes, that is correct. If there is water quality sampling taken, those will be properly cleaned out first before the samples are taken. That'd be an interesting sight to see. Yeah. The, I I have a comment, Adam. Go for it. Um, the, the Bureau Rec piezometers, um, in fact, were sampled by pumping, uh, and the typical two-inch sampling pump fits. That's one reason why the choice of piezometer was made. And the well volume that's associated with a sampling process like that is, um, you know, you're, you're going to uh, displace the water that's in the piezometer itself by some volume. I think what we actually did was uh, pump a, a quantity of water that was related to that volume and then looked at the uh, electrical conductivity of the water coming out. And if you get to the point where you've got a stable electrical conductivity, your assumption is that you're sampling uh, what you intend to sample, which is that zone that the perps are in. That is it. That is indicative of a good sample set, that you are getting That's proper, right. clean groundwater from that zone. Right yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other public comments? Okay. We'll move on to 3A double I, so the water quality isotope sampling. Adam, before she does that, I, I was really negligent. I usually do this, but I want to make sure people know who's here from our office. Everybody knows Heather. Heather's over here. She's going to talk today, and you already know Jean, right? But Jean's brought up Nicole from her office in Carlsbad. She's here. 
and also Scott Thomas from our Reno office, who's here because they were, they came up yesterday, but we're doing work here yesterday. Can I get here you today a for this, little bit closer? And going to be here. And going to be here tomorrow too, um, before they leave. So they're they've been up for a couple of days doing doing work up here. Heather and I came up today, so I usually let you know who's here from our office, and then we have DRI with Jenny and Steve. Great, welcome. Thank you for being here. Okay, over to you, Jenny. Uh-oh, did I turn it off altogether? Yeah. <laughs> there. So do you guys have this, like, in front of you? It's Okay, because I couldn't quite figure out why, how the whole screen thing was supposed to work. And I was hoping I would have a laser pointer, but it's good I don't, because I clearly would put somebody's eyes out up there if I did. <laughs> uh, so, so this is sort of a follow-on from what Jean was talking about regarding the Prop 1 sampling uh, task that's going to be implemented here. And it's specific to the isotopic sampling. And so this is a discussion to try to present to you the information that's available and a potential approach, and I hope that we'll get some feedback on that. The objectives that went in with that Prop 1 proposal were to establish baseline water quality for monitoring, obviously, when the uh, basin management activities go in, to fill data gaps and reduce uncertainty and refine the hydrologic conceptual model, which kind of feeds back into reducing uncertainty and filling data gaps. And definitely the isotopic sampling portion fits those last two objectives rather than the, than the first. But in terms of isotopic data, uh, there, this basin actually has had a lot of work done in it. Uh, some of the important pieces of that previous work are listed on this slide. Uh, importantly, there's work by the USGS that has happened both throughout Southern California with Smith and Friedman, and then within the basin itself, Baron Barak and Schroeder. There have been uh, substantial sampling and analysis campaigns that were done uh, principally through some a uh, students, academics, uh, uh, Houghton being one, and then there were many others uh, through the California state system. Tetratech has done a lot of sampling and analysis for the Navy, and then there were uh, very large efforts through the couple of AB303 pieces of work, and much of that information has all been compiled in, uh, in those last two references, Guler and Williams, which uh, are kind of a clearinghouse for much of that information. But it's important, or it was important to me, uh, looking at this uh, proposal and talking about isotope sampling to realize that there's already a very exhaustive database. And so what is it that's going to be done that would be useful and add to that and not be just duplicative? The Prop 1 wording specifically for Task 8, which this falls into, talks about doing stable isotopes of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, sulfur, and boron, and also specifies age dating of water, which uh, essentially implies carbon-14. Boron and sulfur, and looking at the reports that have already been published, don't, those, the isotopes of boron and sulfur haven't really been used to provide information that you can't obtain from using regular water quality parameters. And so I wasn't really going to focus on those today, but rather look at hydrogen and oxygen and carbon uh, because they do. Am I not speaking loud enough? Oh, oh I will put someone's eye out now. Thank you, Don. <laughs> Send the medical bills to <laughs> D. Decker. Uh, <laughs> Good move with the sunglasses. You guys are on, on it, man. That's terrific. <laughs> I'll try to be careful and use it judiciously. Uh, but hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon are used, uh, do provide unique information and, and will be the focus of the rest of what I'll talk about here. Uh, and, but to get us all on the same page in terms of nomenclature, you know, isotopes, of course, are, are just um, variations of, of atoms and behave chemically the same, but they have different weights. So an oxygen atom is defined by having eight protons, but the number of neutrons it has can vary. Most oxygen atoms in the world have eight neutrons, and so oxygen-16 is what makes up the vast majority of oxygen. But sometimes you have additional neutrons thrown on there such that you can uh, have a weight of oxygen-18. It's a very small portion, 
That's true of all of these stable isotopes that we're talking about. And because it's so small, the easiest way to measure it is actually as a ratio to the larger one. So you'll always see this delta notation. Uh, the hmm, Actually, I'm not sure if it makes it all the way. Oh, it doesn't work on that screen. That's one of those oh, tricky screens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well. So that, that uh, delta notation that's uh, in front of those is, is in indicating that the actual measurement is a ratio, and then the per mil, which is the units that are used, is essentially like percent, but it's in thousands. And, and the reason for both of those is simply because the numbers we're talking about are very small. Uh, so the hydrogen, deuterium, it's, it's also known, which is hydrogen with, uh, with an extra uh, neutron on there. Uh, so the hydrogen and deuterium ratio is uh, defined by fractionation that occurs during phase changes. And just as you might think, the light isotopes tend to go in the vapor phase. The heavy ones tend to go in the, the liquid and solid phases. And so during evaporation and precipitation processes, you have a relationship that develops, and that is what's shown by that global meteoric water line and that you'll see on some subsequent graphs. An example of precipitation values are shown on there. Heavy uh, isotopes are the more on the more positive end, so up on the upper right-hand side. Light isotopes are down there in the uh, lower left, and the light isotopes tend to be associated with cooler temperatures, the heavy ones with, uh, with warm temperatures. On the right-hand side, carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope. It isn't stable. That's what's used for groundwater dating. And the, kind of the carbon cycle is shown on there, the important part of that being that along with carbon-14, you have the stable carbon-13 isotope, which helps to show how carbon is added to water through uh, its cycle. It initially uh, is recharged primarily from CO2 generated in plant roots, but then you can have the addition of carbon uh, through dissolution of uh, carbonate dust, uh, limestone, uh, any sort of carbon source, and that can add dead carbon that dilutes the C14 and can lead to spuriously old groundwater ages. So, um, so back to the actual data set that you have here in Indian Wells Valley, there are over 200 stable isotopic oxygen and deuterium analyses for groundwater samples alone within the valley. And then in addition, there are almost 100 values for surface water samples. So that's a pretty sizable data set. Uh, in terms of carbon-14, there are almost 100 measurements within the valley, but importantly for that data set, some of them are absent the carbon-13 information that needs to come with that to do corrections. And unfortunately, many of them are actually reported as corrected ages rather than the original measurement of percent modern carbon. And, and that leaves um, a real difficulty in not knowing exactly how they were corrected whether those values can be uh, compared to other ones. And so that data set, though large, has more uh, issues with interpretation. But nonetheless, there's a lot of data that are already available. So when posed with the uh, possibility of, of doing the sampling and analysis that is uh, asked for in the Prop 1 proposal, uh, it seems unwise to just haul off on some sort of major sampling campaign. So the approach rather that, that seems uh, logical would be to evaluate this large existing data set in the, concept, in the context of the conceptual hydrogeologic model for the basin, identify where there's any inconsistencies and uncertainties and, uh, and data gaps, and then, then just target to fill those particular data gaps. I think it's important to look at this in the concept of where we are today because even though there have been many studies in the past, a large focus of much of the interpretation of this data set has actually been toward resolving recharge questions in terms of the uh, issues of whether or not there was water coming into the basin from the Western Sierra side uh, rather than necessarily looking specifically at the hydrologic picture of the basin as understood today. So let's look at a map of those existing data. Um, and in, so this is showing a map of the deuterium hydrogen 2 distribution around the valley. 
the lighter isotopic, more negative uh, measurements are denoted by the warm colors and the heavier ones by the cool colors. What's immediately obvious from looking at it is that you, you have more, uh, you have lighter um, measurements that are kind of centered in the Ridgecrest area in the southeastern part of the basin. And what we want to do is sort of compare that then to the places that water could come in. I was remiss in not putting one of those recharge basin maps on here that you've seen from the modeling presentations. But of course, we have mountain front recharge that comes in along the western side on the Sierra. There is uh, a component of flow coming down from Rose Valley through the Little Lake area. There's recharge assumed coming in from the Coso and Argus ranges and then also down in uh, along the El Paso mountain area as well. So we can consider these data in the context of where the recharge values are, and that's what's shown on this plot. On the y-axis is the deuterium hydrogen values, the x-axis is the oxygen values. Shown again is that meteoric water line, that global meteoric water line that uh, is the usual relationship, uh, the red line, the one angling across there. And immediately you see that most of the data are somewhat to the right of that. That's universally observed in semi-arid environments such as the southwestern U.S. and is uh, thought to be related to evaporation actually from raindrops as they fall through the atmosphere, and that's the reason for that displacement. So let's talk about recharge composition. And importantly, I want to highlight the line that is the dashed line that's going across uh, from, and that's from the USGS. And this goes back to that USGS study I mentioned. A real problem with uh, with assigning recharge values is that that it ultimately gets back to precipitation, and it's a, a difficult and time-consuming job to get a good handle on what the isotopic composition of precipitation is, because in our environments. That's usually happening at high altitude, places that are harder to get to, and a lot of it happens in the wintertime. And the only way to accurately do that is to have precipitation collection stations that are collecting year-round so that you can develop a weighted mean value for that precipitation. And that's exactly what the USGS did. Uh, and they had a station at Walker Pass. They had one at Inyo Kern. They had one at Randsburg, as well as other places in the Southern uh, California area. And they concluded that the average for waters recharging in Indian Wells Valley would have a deuterium content of about minus 95, which is what's shown by that line. Now, distributed around that in the data points that were collected uh, from these recharge areas, either springs, streams, uh, that sort of thing, the southern and northern canyons along the Sierra front are represented by the yellow and orange dots that are uh, kind of extending in the in the uh, upper right-hand portion of the of the graph there. I hope you can see it, or if you have a handout, it may be better that the uh, Coso and Argus ranges are represented by a smaller number of, of purple data points that, to a large extent, overlap some of those, um, those uh, Sierra front samples as well. And then the very lightest, the most depleted samples, are those green dots that came from uh, shallow wells that are located in the Little Lake area. Now, there are Little Lake samples that you can also find that are much heavier because they've been evaporated as they have sat in the lake and, and other sources. But the groundwater samples from there that would be underflowing into Indian Wells Valley are represented by those green dots. For reference, then, I've circled those, and you'll see those on a subsequent plot as the area that uh, encompasses the measurements from the canyons, the Argus range and Coso range, and then Little Lake Valley. So shown on this plot are the data that are collected from groundwater samples within Indian Wells Valley itself. And you can see the, the large extent, uh, both of the data set, as well as that they have a wide range of isotopic composition. And we can compare those then to those recharge uh, compositions and see that there's actually good overlap for many of the groundwater samples with the recharge composition that was identified from those western uh, canyons and streams, uh, but that obviously trying to define the difference between that and which groundwaters may have been uh, recharged in the Argus and Coso may be difficult. And then we see that the very lightest groundwaters there uh, that have been measured in the valley coincide 
nicely with that area from, from Little Lake. But this is where things get more complicated, right? Because you can recall from the map that those lightest deuterium values were actually located in the southeastern portion of the valley down near Ridgecrest. They're not up there in the northwest where you would expect to see it if that was the origin of those, um, of those lighter values. And so as, uh, as we talked about at the beginning, those light isotopic compositions are associated with colder temperatures. The reason that they're lighter up there in Little Lake is that that's farther up, a little farther north up in the Sierra that's draining into those uh, colder temperatures are uh, introducing more of the precipitation and recharge there, then by analogy, you can also think, well, wait a second, so maybe those groundwaters that we're looking at in the southeastern valley are not necessarily from Little Lake, but are from recharge that was in the same conditions, those same colder conditions, which invites us to think about them having perhaps come in in the last pluvial period which leads you to wondering about what the groundwater age is. And so if we look at the map of uh, dissolved inorganic carbon-14, uh, the, in this case, the warmer colors are the older groundwater ages, the cooler colors are the younger groundwater ages. And again, I think it's a little hard to see, but there are the oldest groundwater age tends to be over in that southeastern portion of the valley where we had that lightest stable isotopic composition. But predominantly through uh, the majority of the valley, we have ages that are ranging from uh, kind of the last major pluvial events forward, uh, 20,000 years and less. But I would take all of those actual ages with a grain of salt, that grain being related then to the amount of carbon-13 that's measured in those samples. On this graph, we have the uh, corrected carbon-14 age on the y-axis and the carbon-13 stable isotope plotted on the x-axis. The box that I've highlighted there is the amount of C13 that is observed in recharge water as a result of that root action in the CO2 within the root zone. Anything that's heavier than that to the right of that it indicates the addition of a heavier form of carbon uh, and carbon-13 which is associated with solid phase carbon. So that indicates the dissolution of carbonate dust, uh, limestone, other sources of carbon, which will dilute that carbon-14 age. And so what this graph would tell you is that the majority of those carbon-14 ages are, um, have been affected by that dilution and therefore are older than the actual mm -hmm. groundwater is. I'm going to take a short deviation for a advertisement on a different technique, which is dissolved organic carbon. Uh, the analyses that have been done and that historically were usually used for carbon-14 focused on dissolved inorganic carbon. By using dissolved organic carbon, then it's not affected by dilution from aquifer rocks or from carbonate dust because those solid phases are inorganic, they're not organic. And so it makes the correction process much more uh, simple and the ages tend to be, uh, to be more representative of the actual uh, age of the groundwater. And by the way, what, by, what we mean by age is the time since that groundwater has been isolated from the atmosphere. And so I'll give you two quick case studies. The first one's on this bullet here relating to ash meadows. I think it's an area that many of you are probably familiar with, uh, some large springs on the east side of Death Valley. The dissolved organic carbon-14 age for the water discharging in those springs is about 2,900 years, which happens to be in very good agreement with a couple of completely independent sources of estimates of what the age of that water would be. In contrast, the dissolved inorganic carbon-14 ages, which is the same method used uh, for all the data here in Indian Wells Valley, is greater than 10,000 years. So there is a significant difference. The second uh, example that I'll give you comes from the Nevada National Security Site located north of Las Vegas. And these are measurements. Uh, they've actually done quite a bit of work on the dissolved organic carbon uh, approach there, which is why I happened to pick this. And I, I, I focused in on examples of samples from alluvial aquifers and volcanic aquifers uh, in contrast to carbonates. And in that middle column, you'll see the ages that were estimated using the inorganic carbon technique 
and in the right-hand column, the ages that were computed using the organic carbon technique. And again, you'll see significant differences. So something to think about if groundwater age dating is a, um, is a desire of the use of this Prop 1 money would be to do some organic carbon dating. And so finally, I'll just note that even though we've been talking about using each isotope singly, uh, you ideally want to use them together. On this graph, the hydrogen isotope is on the y-axis, and the carbon-14 age is on the x-axis, older groundwater to the right. Again, I wouldn't believe the absolute ages, but relatively speaking, it should still be uh, meaningful. And in terms of the hydrogen, the lighter isotopes associated with cooler temperatures are toward the bottom of the y-axis. And there's a reasonable relationship that you see between that, that the older groundwaters tend to be lighter in isotopes, suggesting cooler temperatures. So by combining them, you can get some additional good information out of it. And as well as combining with each other, then we need to combine them with the hydrogeology. Here, I've kind of flipped it around on you. The deuterium's now on the x-axis, but that's because the y-axis is depth, and it seems like depth should always be on the vertical axis. So, uh, so depth below ground surface is what's shown on the y-axis. There's not a lot of relationship going on there that you can see, but you can conclude that the deeper samples tend to have the lighter isotopic composition, which is over on the left side. So again, maybe uh, associated with cooler temperature recharge. So the last thing I want to kind of leave you guys with, the Prop 1 funding uh, did make reference that, that part of its goal would be to fulfill some of the recommendations from the AB 303 reports. And so I tried to distill those here for your consideration. From the 2003 report, they recommended the oxygen, hydrogen, and carbon-14 is the most informative of the isotopes. They also recommended sampling in the western, southwestern, and northeastern Indian Wells Valley, and they recommended sampling from the recharge areas in the watershed. Some of that work has been done, not comprehensively, but there was additional sampling, principally by the 2008 piece of work which itself then made recommendations to determine the uh, carbon composition from the canyon groundwaters, to resample some wells that had some spurious results, uh, sample the shallow aquifer to better uh, define modern recharge, sample recharge from the El Paso Mountains, a sample in the Little Lake area, and then also in, uh, along the northern ranges in Argus Canyons, and again, a few of these have been done. In particular, the Little Lake and, and Rose Valley area was characterized uh, to some extent during the Hay Ranch, E-I-S, E-I-R, I can't remember the exact phrasing here. Um, so, so a few of these have already been uh, addressed, but I just I wanted to uh, bring that to your attention since that was one of the goals. So to leave it with, then, there's a large data set here, and what we're proposing to do is really kind of focus on understanding that data set rather than uh, immediately go out and start collecting more samples and doing a lot more uh, analyses. So if there are recommendations in that regard or, um, or perhaps motivations for the uh, initial Prop 1 proposals that that we're unaware of, that you would like to have under consideration, then we're all ears. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll go over to the committee. Questions? I have one question, um, which any member of the Stetson team could perhaps address. Have you used any of the um, age dating to then estimate the water the volume of water in storage over the time frame that which water has been accumulating in the basin? No, but I'm not even sure if I completely understand where you're, what you're thinking of with that. So, so it would basically give you a sort of rule of thumb that might, it's not going to give you a very accurate estimate. If you, if you assume the water has been collecting over a certain number of years, you assume that the recharge has been consistent over that period. Mm. You take away certain amounts of annual evaporative loss because there wouldn't have been any pumping, obviously, up until the last century that would give you a you know a ballpark estimate as to how much water has accumulated in storage in the basin during that period of time and then you can cross check that against maybe a very simple estimate of the acreage times saturated thickness times the effective porosity and but it's not static uh, yes that's why you'd have to have some loss 
and and in, in fact, one one thing that I'll I'll mention. I don't remember the exact value, and and I don't know if you were here then, so you may not have had the benefit of it. But but early on, we uh, were looking at essentially transit times across the basin in the groundwater flow model, and 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 that is under a steady state condition of invariant recharge. And your point on that is, you know, well taken that that's uh, an assumption that's probably not entirely true. Uh, but they were on the order of 20,000 years just under just to traverse the mm. basin as it is. So, you know, so even though it's 20,000, some of that water may be quite old. Um, that doesn't mean it's stagnant or static. It's it's still on its way. Right. You know? no, I, and I wouldn't use it as an absolute value. It just would you to be able to say, well, is it in the ballpark of other estimates we put together? That actually kind of spurs another kind of comment question is uh, very interesting, by the way. Thank you for the presentation and pointing out the differences between dissolved inorganic carbon and dissolved organic carbon. Um, and, uh, you know, it seems like there could be uh, quite a difference in age then that we're looking at and doing some evaluation if, uh, if we find that there is quite a variance in that. Yes, there could be. Yeah, so uh, that really... Uh, that will really help uh, better understand and maybe put a different uh, different information out there on on how long uh, we've had uh, storage and uh, just how long uh, just what the age of water is in the basin and 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 you know uh, looking at the hydrogeologic conceptual model um, depth is perhaps not, you know, one of the things that we should be thinking about maybe is uh, looking at the environment of deposition. There's been a fair amount of work done on that, uh, under Tetra Tech, mm -hmm. and how you, uh, how you kind of correlate that with, uh, with age dating, uh, assuming that uh, things are moving pretty slow. So that be, might be another correlation factor to pull into the conceptual model. Well, one point back on the uh, on the age dating part of it. I mean, definitely there's the potential that those ages and therefore the conception uh, of uh, age of groundwater could change. But but if nothing else, we really need to get a better handle even on the inorganic carbon data set because, as I say, without having the original percent modern carbon reported and a carbon-13 and specification of how the correction was done, we could be comparing numbers that are very unrelated to each other just with that inorganic, you know, even without worrying about what the absolute number is, but it's, it could be just total apples and oranges because the amount of difference using different correction methods themselves for the inorganic carbon can vary by many thousands of years. And so that's really important information that appears to have been lost or not captured at any rate in the first place. So it hampers the use of all of those existing ages. Was, was a lot of that done in the AB303 work? Um, I, you know, I can't remember off the top of my head which report it is that, that only reports the corrected ages and nothing else, but, but it's it's a fairly common problem in most of those data sets. It's, diff it's rare to find the percent modern carbon number. What you find are the ages. Yeah, I, I just wonder if the, that isn't worth uh, looking back on and seeing if we can't Oh, track if that it's down. possible, that would, be, that would be very valuable. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know if it is, but it certainly could be worth a couple yeah, it's, of it's calls. It's easy to do because the, the database that, that uh, Nicole's already pulled together. It has the source, and the, we can see which ones have the numbers and which ones don't. And who, and who paid for it? <laughs> you got the wrong seat. In AB303, we do know, uh, have contact with some of the people who did that study, so if we can figure out what we're missing, maybe we can follow up. Right? Okay. I had a couple of questions. Um, so, so what's going to come out of this initial phase, just so I'm kind of clear, is you're going to go back through, look at the existing data, evaluate it the best you can, and then there's going to be sort of a, a data gaps that comes out of that with some recommendations for future sampling. Is that kind of what you envision, or that that was what made sense to me? If sure. you know, if there's better advice or vision, it's just 
you know, certainly in terms of the stable isotopes, that's a pretty big data set. Right. So no, no, I agree. I mean, it I agree. seems, yeah. that, you know, I, it, there's a, the potential to waste the money is there right. if we go out sampling again. Right. And, and I will say that the analysis, you know, for deuterium and oxygen 18 is, is pretty, pretty nailed down. You know, there, right. there's not any reason to think that it's questionable because it's older or something like that. Yes. No, I was just, just because that kind of leads to my next question. So I think during the, during the data gap, portion of it, you know, I don't know in the ins and outs of the grant, but I mean, because we're sort of a pseudo public entity, maybe there's opportunities that we can tap into like a, a non-commercial lab and, and, you know, which can be significantly cheaper to run the analysis than versus a commercial lab. Maybe. Uh, yeah. Certainly the deuterium and hydrogen is a, it's pretty straightforward and it's not very expensive nowadays. Right. The carbon is a different matter and, uh, and you know, if it's certainly for the organic carbon, then that is done on an accelerator. University of Arizona does it. Right. I I don't know the cost right off the top of my head. Big issue there is time. Right. Because they've got so much work in that accelerator that it's months before you see the analytical results come out. And then also some maybe some additional no noble gases. I know some of the work like the other Gene Moran has been doing in the state. You know, maybe there's ways we could kind of tap into some of that, those resources, because I know that you can get some significant reductions in the analysis. Yeah, noble so gases are interesting. They, yeah. they weren't listed as one of the targets right. in the grant information that I received anyway, right. so I didn't consider that. But if we could save some money, you know, with the right lab, maybe there's a way we can squeeze in a couple of noble gases, because that would be helpful as well. Thanks. With that in mind, I have a quick question for Gene. The uh, uh, data gap uh, TSS wells that we're looking at putting in, in my opinion, this is a good opportunity to take some sampling for that because this would be new locations with brand new wells to get some uh, data for for isotope. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple of questions and comments, um, Jenny. The um, organic carbon uh, age dating isn't without its assumptions uh, either. The sequestration of the carbon in, in the uh, organic molecules is assumed to be stable or some kind of uh, dissolution process is assumed, but we really don't have a very good handle on what has actually happened to that water since it was deposited. And I'm just making a comment. I'm not trying to criticize it. it, it this The problem that we face, everybody faces, is actually quite difficult uh, with the assumptions that necessarily are made um, as you, you know, analyze the results you've got. Your comments about the uh, uh, present-day carbon are well taken, of course, um, but the other assumptions that are there about, uh, you know, how the carbon was actually uh, placed in the first place is... Uh, you know, part of the assumption package that you've got. Well, the recharge pathway, you know, being uh, absorbing CO2 from the atmosphere and then through the soil gas and, and along that pathway is, is pretty well established. But your point is still 100% right. I didn't, uh, you know, I, was, I admitted I was doing my sale job, right? So now, now I'll have to give you the disclaimer and the fine print. And in particular, uh, the issues there are if you have sources, additional sources of or organic carbon that your water could encounter. And oftentimes that's not a problem uh, in groundwater systems because the amount of, inor of organic carbon in aquifer materials tends to be very low. If you were in a peat environment, it would, you know, you'd have, it'd be a mess, right? Because there's a lot of organic carbon. And similarly, the place that I think I would have a lot of caution in this valley would be in that organic clay area along Brown Road. You know, any groundwaters that are affected by that may actually have an introduction of or organic carbon that would cause uh, similar problems as you would with the inorganic. So your point is entirely correct. You can't just cavalierly uh, apply any of those techniques. Yes, and that organic carbon that's on under Brown Road is part of the recharge flow system for the valley. It's going to be distributed to the east and um, have its effect known uh, ultimately um, 30, 20 miles away, I guess, is probably a reasonably good number. 
Yes, it would have some dispersed effect. I agree. Yes, and that organic carbon, the the, the material there on North Brown Road, um, there are s similar uh, occurrences further east. It's not just there, but that's where the concentration is pretty spectacularly high. <coughs> Yeah, I have one other comment. Just to follow up on what you said about the grant, that you didn't look at something. Uh, I, work, I work for DWR. I've worked on grants, and, and they're pretty open, and especially in this kind of an approach where you've got, you're going to do a, an evaluation, and then you're going to figure out what you're going to do. I think, you're, I think you should, uh, my recommendation anyway, is you should do what you think. You should recommend what you think would be best for us in terms of this work whether or not it's in the scope, and then figure out how we get it done. And if it's a change in scope in the grant, then we go to, then it's going back to DWR and say, hey, we're going to revisit this scope, and this is what we propose. And as long as it's for the same amount of budget, typically it's not a problem. It's, it's uh, modifiable. So just wanted to make sure you were aware of that. I, I defer to Stetson yeah. and... Yeah. Yeah. Any other comments from the group? Okay, we'll go ahead and go to the public. If you have comments, please come on up. Where Tell us you your name. <laughs> well, no, we're, I mean, it seems odd for me to just sit just down. Just, stay. Yeah, just, stay. just yeah. stay there and answer their questions. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Raymond Kelso, and this was a very interesting presentation. And the reason why is, is because I've been on the Restoration Advisory Board at China Lake uh, overseeing uh, the cleanup of China Lake, okay? Been sitting there for 20 years, and the data that I see and that they present to me, and there's other members of the RAB here tonight, okay? They always come up with the dates of 10,000 to 40,000 years in dating the water, all right? And so the numbers that were presented tonight are a lot different. They're still in the thousands, okay? But still, the stuff that we've been looking at, and maybe you've probably looked at some of this data, I hope you have, because China Lake has a whole bunch of it, and I've mentioned it on several occasions. Now, uh, what does that mean to the overall water situation here at China Lake or Indian Wells Valley, okay? Uh, I grabbed a number up there of like 1,200 years, and that was the most recent number I saw there. That's still a recharge. Uh, that would be your, your uh, minimum recharge number uh, in, in recharging of, of, of the water in this valley. Is, is Number one, is that correct or is that in the ballpark? Number two, uh, if that's the case, uh, still the recharge issue here from a raindrop uh, a rainstorm from last week getting into the aquifer and being pumped out again uh, is still 1,200 years. Uh, we're we're going to be long gone here. So again, I'd like to keep it in perspective here, and um, I'm, I'm hoping this uh, brings some more questions up as to uh, what's what's going on. What what uh, even though we've got different numbers, they're significantly different. How is that going to affect us recharge wise? And what are we going to do here in the next year? Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. Can I respond? Yes. Uh, so first off, in terms of the data, we absolutely, I, I think, have many of the data that you're talking about are within that data set of almost 100 because those would be, I think, a lot of the Tetra Tech values yeah. were, were sampled and analyzed as part of that process. And the age ranges that we have are within what you're talking about, 10 to 40,000 years. The younger dates that I had, like on the chart, were from other areas. What I was implying is that by using that other methodology through correcting, we might wind up changing those measured values that you're familiar with to dates that are actually lower. But we haven't actually done that process yet. But within the data set that we have, we certainly have, I don't know if you have every piece of data that you're aware of, but we certainly have the published values out of the Tetra Tech report are within that scope of 100, and they span the age range that you're discussing. 
The second thing that you were asking is what the age would be of current uh, younger groundwater within the system, and I actually think we don't have a really good handle on that. Part of the reason being because of the uncertainties in those age dates themselves. So even those youngest ages may need to be, you know, tailed back to something younger, as well as it's a matter of where the wells are and, you know, how close to the recharge area is, the amount of time it takes for groundwater to move. There certainly have been measurements within the shallow hydrologic, you know, the closest uh, groundwater zones within the valley that have detected tritium in the groundwater, which is an indicator of recharge within the last 50, 60 years. So, so there is some water that's certainly coming into the basin, uh, but nonetheless, the amount of pumping in the basin is still larger, which is why the water levels are dropping. Thank you. Any other public comments? Okay, back up here to the committee. Yeah, uh, Jenny, maybe you could just comment on aquifer heterogeneity and, uh, and how age distribution is affected by that, because I think that's one thing that maybe there isn't a common understanding of, and that is, you know, the way you do the age dating, you're really looking at a a molecule, basically, or, or maybe a several molecules in groundwater, because of the aquifer being so heterogeneous, those molecules get all mixed up. And so when you just sample very shallow water even, there's a real mixture of ages in that. Do you agree? I do agree, and I would, to your first question of, to comment on heterogeneity, I would say yes. Yeah. <laughs> It is. It's a very heterogeneous system, and essentially, what you're, you know, the the phrase that we of course use is dispersion, and and one way to think of that is when you have dispersion is spreading that occurs due to those heterogeneities on a very small scale, so that as those those molecules of water are moving, then they have to bump around the grains, and every time that happens, then one kind of goes here and there and here, even though the general direction is is this way. And, and that is true even in a vertical sense, such that, that if you have a plume and you know, a source that you let go, there's dispersion in that lateral direction. So the main part of the plume may be here, but there are parts of it that are still moving, coming from that same source that are back behind, and there's others that are up ahead. And so the interpretation of the velocity, what we really wind up looking at is kind of an average, uh, though the measurements are you know, molecule specific. Right, but that can help explain why you don't see real young water, for example. Even though we know real young water is coming into the system, it gets mixed up very quickly with older water. Which is compounded by the fact that you can have essentially dead-end pores that are right. diffusing older water back in and out all the way along the flow path Right, as I well. just wanted to bring that up so everybody understands that. We're not looking at some kind of a very defined system in terms of looking at age. It's, it's very uh, distributed and mm -hmm. heterogeneous and, and erratic, so to speak. Yes. So it's not going to be a real nice layered system of ages. <coughs> yeah. yeah, go ahead. I uh, just almost hesitated to bring it up because I don't have a good memory of this, but it seems to me uh, some of the studies that were done 10 or so years ago, there was the tritium values were... Uh, the uh, data quality was called into question. Are you familiar with that? Yes, that, okay. and, and uh, those were the analyses done by the more academic group. Uh, in particular, Jeffrey Tyne out of Colorado had dated some uh, very rather deep waters from the production wells here and come up with uh, recent dates on them as a result of tritium and those have never been replicated and were essentially discounted for, uh, as a uh, aberration. The dates that I was mentioning here are consistent with the hydrogeologic context. They're from that, uh, essentially the water table level wells uh, in the kind of central part of the valley and, and probably represent actually infiltration, not even from the range front, but within the valley proper uh, in areas where the groundwater table is very shallow. But you're correct, I, and I appreciate you mentioning that so that there's not confusion about that because those all other dates have been discounted. 
they, they were discounted for really good reasons. It wasn't some kind of biases. The, uh, at least in one of the papers, the numbers that were quoted were actually the uh, sensitivity of the measurement and the actual tritium numbers were not detectable. In fact, if the tritium levels had been as high as what they were quoting, it's way, way above what uh, modern day uh, tritium levels are from the uh, nuclear tests of uh, the 50s and 60s. You can't have tritium levels as high as they were in principle reporting. And it's unfortunate because the, that misinterpretation of those data led to an enormous amount of work on a lot of people's part to, to address that hypothesis, which in fact was the reason I think that, that there are so many samples of uh, isotopes here and, and so much work had been spent on it and there was a lot of focus in the interpretation in that way. Okay, thank you. Adam, I think one of the things we want to do is, is any, any th as, as um, Jenny pointed out, any thoughts or comments from TAC members or, or others on, on suggestions for the isotope sampling? Now is fine. You're going to get another chance for sure um, because we're going to put together the information and come up with some suggestions later on. But in the meantime, absolutely, we want input. Okay. We do have the opportunity, well, we've already had that discussion here, but if uh, members of the TAC do have recommendations or questions, you can please email those to me or to Steve, and uh, uh, we will get those sent uh, to the right places where they can look into seeing how well we can get more information, more data, and how it could be used. Okay. Next item is 3B. So this is the Sustainable Management Criteria the GSP Monitoring Network, and we're having the change over to you, Heather. Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to introduce this topic, and then Jean's going to join me uh, to talk more about the GSP Monitoring Network and the groundwater levels and the hydrographs. Uh, what I'm going to introduce first is uh, largely a review, but I think it um, bears repeating as we're getting now down to the timing where we're going to be starting to set the sustainable management criteria. So DWR has defined six what they call sustainability indicators, which are potentially uh, negative groundwater uh, conditions. And all of these conditions and these indicators have to be evaluated in our GSP. They are chronic lowering of groundwater levels, reduction of groundwater storage, seawater intrusion, degraded water quality, land subsidence, and depletion of interconnected surface water. I think we're pretty familiar with those at this point. <laughs> Uh, uh, could I just maybe uh, maybe we can take a minute and just um, decide which ones actually have to be evaluated? Because seawater intrusions... Sure. So uh, from a default position, DWR yeah. says you have to um, at least consider all of them. And, right, um, right. So all of them will be addressed, but of course seawater intrusion is one that, that we can um, eliminate probably from further analysis in the GSP that we're not going to need to be setting minimum thresholds, things like that for, for that one. Right, and I had a question. Uh, I'm sorry to jump into no, your presentation, but I think this is important. Uh, the other one that, that's been, uh, you know, de degraded water quality, I don't, I think we, we have to uh, deal with because of the TDS, but right. depletion of interconnected surface water is one that seems to have been debated, and I'm not sure where we landed on that and whether or not this is, uh, I, I, and I, a part of this is because I don't think we've heard updates on the um, GDEs, the groundwater dependent ecosystems discussion. So I guess I'm looking for uh, Stetson to tell us whether or not this is something that needs to be carried through. And that'd be simple, to, I guess a simple yes or no would be Sure, easy. I mean, we have, um, we have springs in the valley, so in order to protect those, we would have to consider um, the, their potential depletion due to groundwater lowering. Right, and then there's the Playa Lake. That's the other question, and that's where the GDEs are. So, I mean, yeah. if you... If GDEs might more fall into lowering of groundwater levels. I don't know if they would be considered a interconnected surface water um, in this case. I, I think they would be handled by, by the other criteria. Okay. 
Fair enough. But definitely they need to be evaluated. All right. I don't Thank know if Jean has any, something more to say about that, but uh, okay. Okay, perfect. Thanks. That helps me. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. So in order to evaluate and um, mon monitor the sustainability indicators, DJBR has defined um, these five what they call sustainable management criteria. Um, the first one is undesirable results, and that's more qualitative. Um, that, that's defined as um, an occurrence if any of the six sustainability indicators become, quote, significant and unreasonable, and that's left up to our interpretation to define what is significant and unreasonable for this basin. Uh, the second one related to undesirable results is, is the first uh, quantitative criteria, that's minimum thresholds, and that would be the limit where you, you define that as any exceedance of that lower limit would produce an undesirable result, meaning that there's um, a condition that's significant and unreasonable. The next one, interim milestones. Those are the quantitative goals set in each of the five-year increments, as you report to DWR, that they all reach towards the last one, the measurable objectives, the last quantitative goal. That's the final goal that reflects where we want the basin to be set at, uh, operating at, those desired groundwater conditions. The last one is the sustainability goal. That's more wraps up everything. That's a qualitative description of how we're operating the basin sustainably and how we're going to be avoiding undesirable results. So for each of these um, sustainability indicators, the six of them, there are metrics that DWR has uh, provided to, in order to set the minimum thresholds. Minimum thresholds will be most likely the first one that we set. It seems the most logical to start from that point and then work your way up to, towards the goals, towards the measurable objective. So for Lowing of groundwater levels, which we'll be talking about more today, um, the metric for that is groundwater elevation, of course, um, reduction of storage, you look at volume, seawater intrusion, we don't have to really worry about here. Degraded quality, there's a few different metrics you can look at, um, including the isocontours, migration of plumes, and impacted supply wells. Uh, for land subsidence, we'd be looking at the rate and extent, and the same with surface water depletion, looking at um, the rate of depletion. So when you're setting minimum thresholds, they have allowed, DWR has allowed, that we can use groundwater levels as a proxy metric instead of the other metrics that they provided. Uh, as long as you can demonstrate that there's a significant correlation between groundwater levels and that metric. And potentially, we could be uh, using groundwater levels for all of these sustainability indicators uh, for, for setting the minimum thresholds, as long as we can provide that correlation. There's two options for this, two ways that you can use a groundwater levels as a proxy. One, for um, a particular um, sustainability indicator, you could have the same groundwater level be the metric for the, the minimum threshold for lowering of groundwater levels and your other indicator that you want to use it as a proxy. So it could be the same level. The second option is you can have two different levels of groundwater at one particular well. One would be the level for the groundwater levels or um, lowering of groundwater levels, and the other would be for the other indicator. So keep that in mind that it doesn't have to be the same groundwater level. So for our GSP monitoring network, um, it's mostly going to be comprised of our casium wells. Those are the um, wells that we have good quality data for. And um, we're likely using, all of them are going to be monitored, but we're likely can be picking some subset of those wells as to be, quote, key wells. That's not really DWR turn. That's one that we're using as the wells that we're going to set the, all the criteria at. So that's why we can be evaluating today. And when we consider for groundwater levels, some considerations when we consider how we're going to set those minimum thresholds, some things to look at are the natural recharge, induced recharge, and where those recharge areas are, pumping depressions, float barriers, and this is um, what Tim was bringing up, groundwater dependent ecosystem and the requirements for those. So I think Jean can join now for the rest of it. Thanks. Thanks, Heather. 
Uh, one other piece that wasn't on the previous slides is we're looking at shallow well impact. So that ties into groundwater levels clearly. And part of setting the, um, the sustainability criteria and the thresholds is as we develop the preferred alternative, we'll look at what those thresholds are and how we're going to manage that preferred alternative. So that's why we haven't like said, okay, this well for this. Part of it is in the development of the, what the plan will be for having the basin be sustainable. The next series of slides are CASGEM wells and the historical data so that we have a chance to just look at what is happening at different parts of the basin. These graphs were put together um, on a full map. I think these came out of uh, last uh, TAC meeting, the one map with uh, different hydrographs for the different wells within the area. A lot of the CASGEM wells are multi-level, so you can see the movement of groundwater vertically as well as over time. The very first uh, upper left graph, so this is USBR 10. If you look at the map, it's the top one. I'm not going to, right, there are no. Uh, it's the very top well that's in the northwest area. It's above the egg fields. I have a question about one of, uh, some of the data, but we've done no correction on data. You can see that um, the shallow one well is blue, so that's the upper 640 to 660 foot depth where that is. And then if you go down, how these work is, as you go down, it's a different color. But you can see if groundwater is going from a higher level to a lower level, or if it's going from a lower level to an upper level. So in this particular well, in USB 10, if you look over time, other than that shallow mid that has roughly around January, uh, 2005, it has a big jump up. I'm concerned that that's sort of a measuring point error, but I don't know. So we're just, we're just leaving that be the way that it is. Um, but if you look at the current uh, data, the, it seems like that shallow mid has a lower Gene, water level than the rest. If I may rest. interrupt real quick, mm -hmm. I recommend that we can ask KCWA and they may be able to get in touch with Tom Hoslebacher, who was a part of putting these together that far back in time, and he may be able to let us know why there is that big change on right. that. Right. Mm because -hmm. it's possible that they were unable to access the shallow mid well anymore, but then for some reason the coloring was changed on that. Uh, that I don't know if right. all four or if only three can be accessed at that point from some damage nearby. Oh, right. It could end. be a damaged well yeah. or it could be something. So, so I'm not really sure why that big jump is, but you can see generally that it, it says that the shallow water is, the shallow well has the shallowest water. If we go down to the next well, USBR 6, so part of this, there's an aerial photo on the map, and you can see where uh, some of the alfalfa fields are, the round uh, uh, spigot well. Uh, so you can sort of place exactly where those wells are. That one shows, it's a little further away from the Sierras, and it shows that the deep well has the highest water level, and the shallow well has the deepest water level. So what this is saying is that there's, with the clays in that area, the water that's deep has a higher pressure head. So it comes off the Sierras and it has an upward gradient. So that's at six. So these, it's very useful to have these different um, elevations. But you can see over time, USBR six has been declining in all layers, whether it be deep or shallow. And all of the graphs have a 50-foot uh, y-axis. So though they may be different elevations, because the elevations are, are solid with the elevation of the land and, and where that water level is, 
all the graphs have been set up to have 50 feet so that you can compare them to other graphs within this series. And all the times have started in uh, January of 90 and then go through current of the water levels that we have. Coming, so as we travel down, we get to USBR 5. That is on the west side of 395. You can see that in that area where we don't have the clays, the water level's reversed. It's going from shallow to deep, so it's a recharge area. The uh, upper layer showing, um, it looks like almost six to eight feet difference, like it's higher. But again, it is declining. It's declining, let's see, so these are 10, 20, 30, 30 plus feet in um, 10, 20, in 30 years. So roughly about a foot a year for that well. Then if we continue down to NR1, that again goes almost to the Navy boundary. You can see that it's not declining as much, but it's also declining. And this also shows a downward gradient. Now, changes can also be, uh, wells can be influenced by the pumping around it as far as if the water's going up or down. But it's generally how we look at these uh, graphs. So this is what's occurring in the northwest area in the Kaz Gem wells historically. If we go to the next slide, Question, or you sure, you can ask a question. So, so let's, let's say we're going to use these, one of these wells or all four of these wells to sort of set our objectives and thresholds. Mm -hmm. um, let's say look at USBR 6, just, just as an example. Okay. So the shallow, you know, one could say, ah, it's been somewhat stable in that 330 to 350 foot range. And then you go down to the mid and the deep, which those, those are pretty deep screens. Right. Who's pumping from that deep? There's, there's no wells up there that are deeper right. than 700 feet. So, so that goes back to you really got to understand the dynamics before we right. start pulling out these objectives and thresholds. Mm -hmm. um, right. It it's, is the uh, continuing uh, going down from other areas in recharge being intercepted to those zones. I mean, we, you're right. We don't know. And part of... Uh, unpuzzling this is, mm -hmm. you know, to put everybody's brains together, okay, what's happening? But it, one thing you do point out with USBR 6 is see how it was going down and now it's leveled off. That right. also says something too, that something probably has changed in the shallow zone that it's not uh, um, decreasing at the rate that it was uh, shallow in the shallow zone like it was historically, that it has sort of stabilized around the 2170 for the last four or five years or six years. Well, a and pumping changed in 2010-ish. I mean, okay. so, so it slowed down. So again, it shows you in that area, you know. Um, right. But, but I guess the challenge I think is how do we deal with these deeper zones? Right. Is it being controlled by pumping? I, you got to have a well or something down there to, to, to Yeah, you know, something's that. causing that, yeah. but right, and, but it's not fully known. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, if I might make a comment, uh, mm -hmm. Eddie, uh, what you have here is um, evidence of substantial vertical connectivity. The aquifer um, at, in the deeper zones is responding to shallower zone behavior. Mm. It's These are pressure heads. I mean, if I'm getting it correct, so when you... Uh, take away the weight of the water above, you're still going to get that declining Absol water below. Absolutely. So these are not, these are translated as water levels. But what you really, well, th these aren't data loggers, so they're not pressure heads. They are water level measurements. But it is a, it, you're measuring the water's response to the full overburden above it when you have a well that's open up down here. So you take that water away, then you still have that. No, no, I, I, I agree, but it, it's just an interesting, it's a bit of a shift because, you know, the focus has been for the last few months, it's always been on, we've got to get to this magic number 
whatever right. that number is, plus or minus 50%, mm -hmm. whatever it is. But really what the, the proof is in the pudding is when DWR is going to say, okay, USBR 6, shallow, what's your, what's your objective, what's your threshold, and then we're going to make sure we get those set right. Right, yeah. right. It's not, yeah, this isn't going to be like a quick, oh, here's a number and that'll be easy. It, and that's why we're starting this discussion is good. I think also we need to really focus in on some of the domestic wells. Like we need to get those in the mix somehow, you know, especially yeah. in these sensitive areas. Yes. And uh, we recently just added another, thanks to Stefan Vork, we added another domestic well into the monitoring up there. This begs a question from me. Uh, we know that this is an unconsolidated system, and but yet some of these uh, wells here, the shallow zone, is showing something's happening a little bit differently. Maybe they're getting a little bit more uh, recharge or something's happening. Maybe there was a nearby pumping well that is no longer pumping. But yet, right. I just want to make sure that everybody understands we don't have like a consolidated, or excuse me, yeah, a consolidated zone that completely isolates stuff. These are interconnected because Correct. of the basin that we have. And so I just think it's important that people understand we're not similar to different locations where their water changes do not show as ours do. We have this continuous drop in how much water we are losing in our basin for decades. And so if we do see some nice little changes, they may be from little things, but I don't think that our G, uh, uh, groundwater sustainability plan should show that yes our shallow zones must be operated in this manner our middle zones need to be operated in a better manner or our deeper zones because they're all interconnected but it's the well it's the it's the well you're going to use right. to, to manage that so you have to set a, an objective and threshold for each well so you you, you, you got to set a number so is this not a good well to use well, you, uh, well. you don't have to use all of the piezometers in, in a given BR well, and shallow. you can use the shallow. So then that begs which one is GSP going to need? We're going to have to have that discussion. What are we going right. to have to so use? Right, so this will be, this is not a this we shall use. This is a, this part is, let's look at what's really happening in these wells that we at first went, look at all the CASGEM wells. They're a really nice distribution, and they're also vertically uh, um, set so they, they're good potential but part of it is having this discussion and going well does that well itself make sense mm -hmm. um, and we almost need to put pumping right next to it but we don't have pumping by well we have pumping by category and we don't have all the this happened right here in 2000, uh, 2015 unfortunately but but we'll come up we'll we'll keep talking about it and we'll look at it with the modeling scenarios and see uh, which one we're going to take or recommend that the TAC will recommend okay while we're looking at Gene while we're looking at this map I brought this up before the Kermagee well 17-2 um, which is obviously in section 17 that's your high um, rate of decline section on your shallow well right so that that particular well 17 2 was very well characterized in its day and uh, it it is on the uh, Kern Water Agency monitoring list and uh, there may be a, a good reason why it, it isn't here but I'm pointing it out again. Uh, it really, from my perspective, it really, really should be on this short list. Thank you. We'll, we'll uh, look at it and add it in as a, a hydrograph on these maps. I just want to make a comment that I'm sure Steve and his team are very much aware of, but certain members of the public might not be. Um, the, there's a misconception in many basins that Sigma and the sustainable management criteria is about how much pumping you can do in any particular year. And that the sustainable management criteria is about reducing that pumping and therefore the milestones are pumping an acre feet per year. And they are not. Sigma is about undesirable results okay. and about establishing minimum thresholds and measurable objectives for water levels primarily. Correct. Um, and if you can manage your basin 
and hit those measurable objectives and stay above those minimum thresholds, you, you may be able to pump the basin for much more than what might be a safe yield. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not about targeting some number in terms of acre feet per year. It's about targeting those thresholds, in this case and in most cases, about water levels. Correct. The only thing that, that um, modifies what you're um, talking about is that this basin has been in steady decline for a long time. We have a historical condition. It's not just recent. And um, the um, idea of uh, exceeding what we might call the safe yield, the 7650, let's say, we could certainly do that for a period of time, but th there's a, a, a price to pay. There will have to be, a, at some future point, a reduction. You may be able, to, in, in pumping below that number, to kind of catch back up. And so that really doesn't give us a, a whole lot of extra cushion, especially since the shallower wells are the the... the, the target of, you know, I, I say it that way, They're, they are the, um, the canary in the coal mine for declining water levels. So mm -hmm. we're already uh, repairing shallow wells. So it's not like it's a future thing that's going to happen. It's been happening and it will continue. But again, my point being that it's about the water levels. And basically, if, if whatever that threshold is, that minimum threshold, ultimately that will, the outcome of those water levels will be your pumping rate eventually. Well, and realistically, there, at some point and down the road, it will be some number close to what might be perceived as the safe yield. Uh, well, they're intimately connected together. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. But it's the, it's the levels that set are set within sigma, not the pumping rate, is what I'm trying to get at. Oh, right, and, and I think this is a very important point that, uh, that's that been brought up, and that is, you know, we're, we've got a model, and it's based on our best guess at the safe yield. And if you talk to DWR, they're going to say, you're going to manage by your minimum thresholds and measurable objectives mm -hmm. the data, not by the model. The model's a tool to do conceptualization, look at alternatives and how to bring things into balance. And we debated this in the model ad hoc as to what the actual safe yield is. And it was anywhere from, some people want to, thought 2,000 acre feet a year up to, to 11,000. And then if you look at the literature, it could be up to 30,000. But So we started with this range of more like Four to eleven thousand, but that you know, so that's the that's just a range, and so we use this. We're using this model with that s estimated yield in it, but it's going to be the tools that we use to manage the basin during implementation are the groundwater levels and other measurements and real data we use. That's a very important point, I think, that we need to continue driving home. Right. And, and I will use a quote I often use, and Eddie will recognize this probably, from Joe Scalmanini. <laughs> when asked, well, how do you tell if an aquifer is in trouble? He says, the aquifer speaks to you. And it speaks, <laughs> and it speaks to you through water levels. <laughs> right, right. 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 <laughs> That's how and, the aquifer communicates whether it's having a problem. That's right. Right. And this is real data. This is not simulated data. This is not from the model. Right. This is water levels measured in wells, Historically, and and this is what what's great is the I, it started with the cooperative group that they put in this program so we have a history of what is happening all through the basin. So the graphs are going to look different as I move to different areas within the basin because they are different uh, things happening in each part. So the next if I may area. Interrupt you real quick. Just a quick question on the Kermagee 17-1 well right. that you mentioned. Is this an active well that's going being used right now, or is that no. well already gone and plugged so that there no. is no data? None of that. Uh, it was a well uh, that was. It's actually on Navy property. It's um, north of the 
in your current substation about uh, three and a half miles, mm -hmm. and it was a a project that might have led to a production well for then Kerr McGee, and it's not plugged. It is uh, still open, and the casing is still, you know, viable. But it is now on Navy land. It has always been on Navy land, as it turns out. Well. Actually, it was switched just a bit so that they could get in there and drill it off the Navy land, and then it was switched back. No, it was well, it was. That's a, how it, I was always told on it. No, so. it was an it was a memorandum of understanding. Either way, I don't think it's active or even being monitored right now. Is yes, it? No, it, it, it is being, being monitored. monitored. I monitor that twice a year. Huh? You do? Okay, yes. cool. I did not know that one. And I've got the log for it. <laughs> yes, because we had the logs for Full that. Yeah. data set. That's good, and we will add it to the. Uh, we'll add it to these graphs. We'll look at it and evaluate it. That would be good. I have a question, perhaps for you, Steve. Um, Don mentioned that there's a lot of information on wells that are having to be redrilled or abandoned because of declining water levels. Are you collating all of that? On which specific wells have been um, abandoned or redrilled because of uh, declining water levels? Uh, we are not doing that now, no. Um, as part, we've reported the board before, or the, the TAC committee and the board before. Um, there is an evaluation being done on shallow well impacts, but it's, it's a, a it's fairly general evaluation of shallow well impacts. Um, as part of the GSP, we've also distributed a, an outline of what our approach would be to do that kind of an evaluation um, for input from the TAC and, and to the public. Um, we, our intention is that that an outline like that will, or a, a, a section on shallow well impacts, will be a part of the GSP, but it's not going to be done for the first draft of the GSP. This is work that's anticipated to be done after we submit to DWR and start working on, on additional work. So it's not going to be done as part of our GSP. But it, I mean, it would seem valuable if Don has that information to provide it to you now. Yes, and there's there's been uh, ongoing. There's been some discussion about how much information is available and how much information we're going to get, and how much work the board wants to do um, to gather domestic de minimis well uh, information. So we're still working on that. It seems as though right now there's some more momentum. Um, there is some work. Is Don still here? Don's here. There's some work going to be done between our office and the water district's office to start looking at um, at least cooperatively or voluntarily collecting some some additional shallow well, domestic de minimis well data going forward. But that's not something we've, we, we've been able to do so far. There was a discussion early on on registration of shallow de minis, domestic de minimis wells and it was, it was stopped. So that, that didn't proceed. So, the objectives and thresholds that we set for this GSP probably are not going to reflect any of the domestic well probably information. Not, but I'm not. I'm not saying it won't reflect any, but it certainly won't reflect the work that we need to do on on uh, evaluating impacts to shallow wells, evaluating causes of those impacts, um, evaluating potential mitigation and cost, and, mm -hmm. and developing a mitigation plan. It won't include any of that. Okay. But we do have some shallow well information, so right. we may have some information as part of the GSP. It might be included as part of the GSP mm -hmm. for what we have. Probably need to talk to DWR and see how that would kind of be. Yeah, but because it is, it's, it's probably one of the greatest concerns we have in this space. And I, yes. I think everyone recognizes that. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so having real data would really help. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that your analysis may say, well, in this area we'll have impacts, but in this area we're probably okay. But Don's data may show that in that area that you think is okay, there may already be impacts. Yeah. So it would be very important to know that. Yeah. We, we've estimated there's impacts everywhere already, yeah. historically. And um, that we don't have the inventory just because the wells have not been registered, um, nor have we been fully tasked with that work. But, but the analysis seems fairly sound, and the TAC uh, reviewed it for over three or four TAC meetings the process of it, and uh, gave input onto the assumptions that could be used for it, including the counting of how many wells. I mean, even just getting an inventory and where they are and where those estimates are. So that has all been worked out through the TAC 
over, over a series of TAC meetings. But you're right, it's, it is, it's tied right in with shallow, uh, with uh, water levels and impacts and domestic well owners, I talked to someone at a coffee shop that said she just had her well redrilled and um, when I started talking to her, she had no idea until I look, we looked exactly where her well was and where the water levels were, that the real reason, and she said, oh, my water's saltier now, that she had to go deeper. And uh, then it was like, she didn't even realize that the reason her well failed was that it ran out of water. She paid the bill for drilling deeper, and now she's clear about it, but it's part of uh, an outreach and an education that has to happen. So I don't know how well we would get you know, a survey because not everybody really understands their well. A lot of people do though, I mean, because they're paying the bill. And we did get costs from local drillers for deepening wells and for redrilling so that we would understand some of the costs. And they are busy out there, deepening wells. I and mean, at least the drillers said they were. We, we haven't gone to the extent of saying, oh, how many wells did you do this year and how many that year? We haven't done that at this point. But, but we feel that it's, it's a fairly good estimate to, for planning purposes. Okay, next one. Southeast. So this is Ridgecrest. We're in the southeast right now. And where these wells are is uh, MW32. I'm not sure. Sorry, the handouts are two per page. But it is when you come 395 and you sort of hit the, is that Inyo Kern Road? It's right in that corner. That's where uh, MW32 is. And you can see that it's a multi-level well again. It has three levels. And that this is a discharge area. The water levels are coming from the deep and they're vertically going up. And you can tell that by that the shallow is the deepest and the deepest is the most shallow water. So there's a vertical upward gradient in this area. You can also see that there is more changes over time in the shallow, that it's much more dynamic in terms of um, going up and down through different years compared to the mid or the, the deep is, is uh, less even. And the change over time looks like it's roughly, if I look at the deep, it's dropping about 30 feet in 25 years, so it has a similar drawdown rate as some of the other wells we saw in the Northwest. USBR4 is the one that is on Navy property in that little chink that comes south of Inyo Kern Road. It does not have multi-level piezometers, it has just one. And you can see that it has dropped some, but it's fairly seasonal. These are water levels that are collected in the fall and collected in the spring. So spring water levels tend to be higher. Fall water levels seem to be a little bit lower after the pumping through the summer. So you see that seasonal imprint, but, but it relatively uh, has stabilized at this level. It's water, it's screen interval. So on each of these graphs, it also gives a screen interval after the well. So it is uh, 1,200 feet down that this water level is being measured. And it is, looks like it's fairly stable, though it sees a seasonal um, uh, pumping or, or seasonal imprint on it. USBR 3. You, if you drop down along 395, that well is the one that's uh, USBR 3. And uh, it has the deep also has a higher water level than the mid and the shallow. So again, this is a vertical upward gradient of this particular water. The conceptual model is that most of the recharge comes in at the Sierra front and then it goes into the aquifer. Some stays in the shallow, some goes uh, old lake bed deposits, some goes under that. So that water down deeper has a higher pressure head. So that 
when it's under the clay, it will have a pressure head coming up. So that is a meeting with the USBR3. The uh, last well on this one is over to uh, right under Ridgecrest, sort of. Uh, and it is showing a decline over the 30 years of about uh, 20 feet in that area. And where the well was that the woman had redrilled was off to the east. It was sort of good. I pulled up the website. For those of you that know, I, I, I am a high proponent of going to that website. I pulled up the website, pulled up a well right by her well, and showed her a hydrograph so that she could see what was happening. So that's the southeast. The next one is the El Paso area. So this is on the... Uh, in the El Paso has a fault. The El Paso Basin is separated from the Indian Wells Valley main basin by a fault. The water levels here tend to be higher, and they also um, are not, uh, they, um, they're higher on that side of the fault than on the f side where Indian Wells Valley is. The upper graph is USBR2. So this was uh, drilled in the... Uh, 1990s, and you will see that the um, that it's sort of a mix. The shallow is in the middle, the deep is low, and the the mid is high, and that there's just a slow, steady decline, but not as much as in the the main basin. It uh, the water levels there are declining by about um, eight feet, looks like, and that's over 30 years. So their rate of decline is much lower at that area. So USBR2 is south of uh, Inyo Kern Road, and it's sort of the upper one of those two lower ones. And then the graph below it, USBR1, is the lowest well on this map to the right. There, the, you can see how it's relatively flat. So in the El Paso Basin in this area, which is close to Freeman Wash, and then where it meets up with, um, uh, what's the other wash? The Dixie Wash. Dixie. Where it meets up with Dixie Wash, it's really close to that confluence. And um, though things were happening initially in those four posometers, they've all sort of stabilized and are fairly flat uh, in this basin in that area. So USBR1, as far as we understand and know where the faulting is, this is south of the faulting, and it's separate from USBR2 that is within the greater basin on the north side of the fault. Uh, USBR2 is also south. south of the fault. That is also south of the fault. Yeah. Right. Okay. But it's, and it's not declining as much as the regular basin. Oh. Okay. Yeah, BR2 has kind of an intermediate water level. Right. It's, it's not um, in really an equilibrium with the main basin, but neither is it uh, agreeing with the uh, BR1. Right. Yeah, that's so pretty different. So still to be definitely some data gaps up there. Still to be determined? Still to be determined, but, but I, I think it starts at least telling us what's happening at different parts of the basin. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then the last graph that... Uh, we put up here is a, a well on the Navy property. And we also blew up the map because that way you can see where all these wells are that we put. And uh, this is the Sandquist Spa uh, well that gets uh, monitored uh, twice a year. You can see that in that area of the base, the water levels uh, have been declining for about 20 years by these measurements by about 10 feet. And uh, so these are the current CASGEM wells. And uh, we do, uh, I'll take Don's uh, Kerr-McGee well. And if there's other wells that you have um, looked at in your studies that you have done on the basin that you think we should consider, uh, please let us know because that would be valuable. Yes. Go you, no, go ahead. You first. Okay. I had a couple questions. Okay. Are you guys trying to limit your number of wells for this sort of thing to a 
For measurable objectives, yes. We are planning on using all 192 wells as the monitoring plan that currently exists. We've actually started adding some wells into those that we see would be useful. And those will be for the general uh, um, contour maps of groundwater surfaces. Because in some areas, like up against uh, Indian Wells Canyon, the water levels there are fine. They have spring, and, and those are, are, st are very stable. But when you get toward pumping centers, the rates of decline can be one to three feet in a year. So we want to have a nice distribution. So we're using, let me answer your question then, 192 wells. And uh, these, we're looking at those more targeted um, uh, criteria kind of monitoring. Just to keep it manageable. Uh, keep it manageable, keep it as a key wells, probably even less than these, you know, that we would, we would look and we're looking at, okay, will it show us pumping inf uh, influences? Will it show us recharge influences? Will it show us, so we're looking at what we want to make sure they're measuring and, and keep those. So my second question then, um, uh, I kind of expect that there will be some attention to the groundwater dependent ecosystems as a, a mm, metric. Right. We're waiting for the Navy to hopefully have, um, you know, what their, we need to work with the Navy regarding that because most of groundwater dependent ecosystems are on the Navy. Those plant vegetation types that the Nature Conservancy has uh, mapped uh, with aerial photos and we need to just work out which wells we would use on Navy property for managing those water levels. And they're not in here at this point. Roger that, okay. Mm -hmm. Gina, I had a question. Just since you have the Navy well up there and there's, you know, drawdown through time. Um, mm -hmm. how, how, is, how is that gonna be managed? Then also building on what Stefan just talked about with the GDEs, how, how can that be managed without reducing pumping? Well, we did remember, if you remember back to some of the water um, modeling that mm -hmm. was done, we sort of did bookend modeling. It seems like it's been a while since we've had right. modeling results. But when we did those, we saw that there still was sort of a continued decline, but then there was a response. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the reason we're waiting to um, uh, set the criteria is we'd like to see what the modeling results say. and and. There will be, the water levels will probably still decline even if we stop pumping tomorrow. It takes a while for it to, to recover. So we would, we need to sort of look at that and set it. it it's, not a, it's not an easy thing and we may have to bracket it somewhat with I think the DWR. challenge, I remember Jenny brought this up a couple of months ago, was if, if, if you use the, the simulated water levels to set objectives, it's going to be, I think that was kind of what or may have paraphrasing of. a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it be a bit of a challenge. You give me a dirty look or you agree? No, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think it's going to fall back to real data. And so just kind of going forward, I think that's something that you, you maybe you're already having those discussions with the Navy, but, you know, it's going to have to happen. So. Right. Stefan's mm -hmm. going to throw something at me, I think, but yeah. Yeah, let me get some. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I just want to clarify <laughs> I think the way you said that is you're waiting for the Navy, but well, if this is kind of a topic that the data gap ad hoc group mm -hmm. should probably address, that may be in addition to the aquifer testing pairs that we've talked about. But right, yes. It's, it's more of the fact that we need to uh, have a discussion about that. And Not using really. existing wells that the Navy has uh, versus right. we, I don't see us needing, given their the numerous number of wells that they have, uh, I, I would think it, it's more a matter of us picking and agreeing on the vegetation coverages. Because the Nature Conservancy gave us one, but that does not equal the vegetation coverage that the Navy has. So we've got to rectify those two, and then the proposal has to say what we will do based on that vegetation type, types. And if we need bio biological monitors that go out and check the vegetation, um, you know, each spring, I, I'm not sure how that's going to work, but we've we've been talking about it. 
Yes. Yeah, the, uh, the El Paso area uh, is kind of a big blank. Mm -hmm. And so maybe uh, picking uh, the highway well or the Black Hills well is, is a key well out there. Would probably I have be a good taking notes. <laughs> yeah, it would probably be a good idea because mm -hmm. it just, you know, we don't want any big, wide open blank spaces to submit this, I think. Right. And, and I know what you, it, this is a key well versus you're going to be monitoring those anyway. Right. And did I hear you, uh, what I understood you say about the Navy property was there would be some key well or key wells selected over there as well? Probably for the GDE. Be yeah. uh, specifically, because they, there's a lot of uh, vegetation uh, that's groundwater dependent. Right. I think, again, it's just the comment of it's a big blank space without any key wells. So it's kind of, you know, it's a red mm -hmm. flag when you Right. When it it goes would into be a red duct. flag yeah. to put up this map yeah. at the so moment. So those are just my, my comments. Thanks. That's good. Thank you. Any other comments? Any other comments from the committee? Yeah, okay. great presentation. Thank you. Thanks. It's, it's right. good data. I want to thank the cooperative group, which a lot of you are members of, were members of. If it wasn't for that, these, this data wouldn't be here, which is it's a good set of data. All right. We'll turn over to the public if you have any questions or comments. Good afternoon, Derek Hoffman, uh, attorney for Meadowbrook, and thank you, Gene, for your presentation today. Um, the sustainable management criteria is one of the most important pieces of the GSP, as you all know, and that's pro probably, you know, it's, it's not an easy process to do, and that's probably why, in part, uh, the best management practice for this particular aspect of a GSP is still in draft, actually, at DWR, just illustrating the challenge of, of doing that. And um, my comment is that you know, we're just starting this process now in this basin. We're just starting to understand, you know, and evaluate, you all are, what the minimum thresholds ought to be, what the measurable objectives ought to be, what significant and unreasonable ought to mean in this valley. And, and so we've got a lot of work ahead of us here. Um, my comment is that, you know, in a few minutes, we're going to hear that all four of the modeling scenarios for the basin have already been decided. And so those modeling scenarios incorporate projects and management actions for the basin. So my point is that it's a bit difficult um, you know, to evaluate those modeling scenarios when we're still working on the thresholds that ought to be used to help uh, establish those. Um, so that's my, my comment for the moment. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think we see it as that the two actually come together, that you balance both of them together to, to get both the, the preferred alternative and, the, and uh, what will be key for monitoring. If we, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. I, I see it as the two actually do come together when you have uh, the modeling scenarios and then we have these discussions, but then we go, okay, if this is our preferred alternative, how, what are our thresholds that we're going to do for this particular alternative? Because each alternative has been so different uh, of what it would measure. Just, I don't know if that makes sense. Just to follow up, I, I agree, Jean, Jean, that's exactly right. And um, actually, um, Derek is correct. Our Prop 1 grant allows us four model runs. Um, direction, and I'll be talking about it in a few minutes um, when we get to the last item under the Water Resource Manager Report, but um, we've already been authorized um, to do three more runs. We've done two that have been charged to that, so we've already been authorized by the board to do five model runs with the understanding from the board that we expect to do at least one more if we can come up with a model run we think is close enough to an implementation plan that we want to fine-tune it uh, 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 to make it an implementation plan run that is a real that is a real model run for an implementation plan, we've let the board know we expect at least one more. Derek, we've had a discussion about uh, other possible runs, and and uh, Meadowbrook's express uh, Meadowbrook through Derek has expressed an interest in in, in a run. Um, so I think the board is open to additional runs, knowing that 
um, we don't have the budget and the Prop 1 grant funding, um, and that it may need to come from another source. And like I said, I'll be talking a little bit more about that later. Okay, thank you. Any other public comments? Okay. We are moving back into uh, the items, so we're on 3C. This is the land subsidence analysis and future monitoring. All right, since this is the first time I'm addressing the committee, I'd like to formally introduce myself. I'm Steve Bacon. I'm an associate research geologist at the Desert Research Institute. I'm also a PG and a CEG in California. Uh, for over 20 years, I've been studying the quaternary geology and tectonics along the east side of the Sierras, specifically in No One's Valley and recently in uh, Searles Lake Basin, which also includes China. So I'm going to share some, some recent results from an analysis on land subsidence conditions in Indian Wells Valley, and I'm excited to share these results. It's quite interesting. All right, so the outline of this talk is going to go over the tectonic and geomorphic setting, followed by a subsidence environment. And that's going to include a description of the aquifer materials in Indian Wells Valley and their susceptibility to subsidence. After that, I'll show some examples of historical observations of subsidence through the analysis of satellite-based INSAR measurements as well as level line surveys on base. And then after that, I'll share some examples of uh, temporal correspondence between groundwater level and land surface changes. All right, as we all know, we live in a seismic uh, active area of California, specifically along the east side of the Sierra Nevada. Uh, in addition to seismicity, um, there's also um, potential for volcanism or volcanic activity in the Coso Range. Um, here, this map shows the groundwater model domain and it shows the active Little Lake Fault Zone, which is shown as LLFZ, and it intersects the entire model domain. And it had a historical rupture in 1982, and many of you may have remember feeling that earthquake in 1982. There, there was actual historical rupture. And if you can see highlighted in red, you can find that LLFZ, Z fault, you'll see uh, the snort alignment. And right in bounding that alignment, you'll see shown in red essentially the historical rupture from that 1982 earthquake. And then there's the airport lake fault zone, which is just to the east. And that had historical rupture in 1995, part of the Ridgecrest earthquake swarm. I'm sure many of you remember that, too, because these were both magnitude 5 earthquakes. So they would have rocked this part of the world. And then, as already mentioned, is the El Paso Fault. It, ha it shows evidence of latest Pleistocene to Holocene activity. So no historical rupture has been identified yet. And that's in the southwest part of the model domain. And then there's the Sierra Nevada Frontal Fault. We all see the range front, uh, but geomorphic evidence for activity uh, suggests it's late Pleistocene. And then, as mentioned earlier, there's the Coso Volcanic Center. And in this map, in dark, uh, in the northern part of the model domain, you can actually see lava flows associated with that volcanic center. And just a side note before I forget, in 1982, during that earthquake, uh, the seismic patterns associated with that seismic swarm suggested um, volcanic activity. In, in fact, some folks from the USGS modeled a tabular dike intrusion associated with that. So something to consider. Steve, before you move on, uh, 
what kind of displacement was that on the Little Lake and the airport? So was it? Uh, that was measured in centimeters. It was a lateral, or, or? Uh, it was it was lateral on the Little Lake fault, and normal on the Ridgecrest on the airport. airport. Lake. Okay. So here's an example of the geomorphic setting. Uh, here's some mapping that was performed on base. For reference, you can see the installation boundary. In, uh, in, the, in the northwest, you can see the corner. Uh, this is mapping of landforms below the 700 meter elevation contour. I've been working in meters a lot, so excuse me. I, I'm gonna be bouncing around between metric and imperial units. But, um, so right here, it's a great example of the type of landforms you expect here in the basin and range. Uh, you have alluvial fans, and since the legend is small, those are shown in a dark orange. And then you have alluvial plains, which are the low gradient, uh, the flood plains of distal alluvial fans, and those are shown in, in uh, bright yellow. And then you have lacustrine and playa surficial deposits, and those are shown in the different blue colors. And here in particular, in green is deltaic deposits, and those are associated with the Pleistocene China Searles Lake. And that formed when the Paleo Owens River essentially entered into that lake and deposited a very large um, wad of sand or a large deposit. And then in red, different shades of red are sand dunes. And in particular, I want you to pay close attention to the distribution of blue colors, the lacustrine and playa. They're silty to clay deposits. They're fine grain. Um, alluvial plains, they'll have a combination of both sand and silt, so both coarse and fine. And then the alluvial fans, deltaic and, and the sand dunes, they're coarse grain. And as you can see, it's a complex mosaic. There's a lot of different landforms, different rock or soil types distributed across this area. And that also includes in areas to the, to the southwest that aren't mapped. It's predominantly alluvial fans and, and alluvial plains. And also shown are faults, and you can see in some areas, like where the green deltaic deposit is, you can see how that landform is truncated, where, where you have alluvial plains and fans right up against that deltaic deposit. And I present this information because it's surficial deposits, but we're talking about hydrogeology and the subsurface. You can take this pattern and you can envision that in the subsurface. And it goes back to the comment of, of how different the aquifer materials are here on bay, or here in, in the groundwater basin. So this slide's going to introduce some of the subsidence environment, the aquifer materials. Uh, there's been extensive work done in the past on characterizing the hydrogeology. And in those studies, they identified coarse-grained alluvial fan sediments, uh, sediments that resemble alluvium that have a combination of coarse-grained material with fine grain layers interbedded with them, and lacustrine and playa fine grain units. And in particular, study identified a very large area of fine grain sediment, which have the characteristics of lacustrine and playa sediment. And on the, on the map, you'll see a large area shown in blue. That is the extent of that fine grain lacustrine slash playa uh, unit. In red are production well sites. And for reference, you should be able to see uh, China Lake installation boundary, or at least you'll see the outline of, the, of those dots, essentially the boundary with base. Um, also shown on the map are 
transects of cross sections that were previously uh, developed. I'd like you to see the, the west to east transect, that's A to A prime, that's the cross section on the top right. And you can see in orange, you have the gravelly alluvial sediments that are underlain by a large accumulation of alluvium. And under that, you have essentially bedrock on the base of the section. What's very interesting is the color blue. That's the, the fine grain lacustrine sediment. And you have the Little Lake Fault right there. What's important for evaluating the potential for subsidence is that overlapping relationship. Essentially, it's a facies change between alluvial fans and lakes through time on glacial time scales. Interglacial periods, you had fans extend out into the depot center area. And then when it turned to glacial times, the lake formed and you'd have fine grain sediment on top of that course. And that's what you see there. You see there's a, in the subsurface, uh, essentially a finger of fine grain uh, sediment interbedded with coarse grain. Uh, section underneath that, B to B prime, shows similar sediment and a less pronounced facies change. But there is an interpretive boundary between the lacustrine and alluvium of an overlapping relationship. And similar is shown on the C to C prime. So that's the conceptual model of the hydrogeology in the basin. And this next slide is going to describe uh, the soil mechanics behind how you actually form subsidence or how, how, how you potentially can create it. So of note, out of all those hydrogeologic units described earlier, alluvium and the lacustrine units have the highest susceptibility to subsidence because of the fine grain character. And, and because of that, well, they're, they're um, prone to compaction when groundwater is lowered. And the schematic on the right shows a section of interbedded fine grain material, silts and clays, similar to the lacustrine sediments, with coarse grain sands and gravels. And the section on the left shows a groundwater table above the fine grain unit. That fine grain unit is saturated right now because it's below the groundwater table. The pore pressures in between the particles actually add support and increase the soil strength of that material. However, when you lower that groundwater table to below that unit, which is shown on the right, if you look at the schematic, you'll see that fine grain material has now compacted because the pore water pressure between the particles aren't there to support the overlying weight or the overburden. So it compacts and you lose volume and that's reflected as subsidence at the land surface. And you can see that in the right. Uh, of note, you can have a large area of fine grain material which potentially may have a similar extent of subsidence or similar rate. However, if that is up against a fault or a fault has offset that unit, or if you're within alluvium that has smaller or less extensive inner beds of fine grain material, you can have differential subsidence or the land surface will subside at different rates within a relatively short extent. All right, so I find these imps very interesting. Here's historical observations of subsidence as well as uplift. So this is satellite-based INSAR data. And this was previously processed by Katzenstein 2015. And I don't know if you can see it. Cause it's a real busy map, so I'll, I'll walk you through this right here. So on the left, that map 
is data that was analyzed between 1992 and 2000, or between 1992 and 2000. And the range in colors, the blue or cool colors, represents a positive surface change. You can interpret that as relative uplift. The red or hot colors is negative surface change. You can interpret that as subsidence during this period. The, the magnitude, I can't see it shown. is about 64 millimeters of positive surface change, which is about 2.5 inches. And the red, the low, is a negative, about a negative 38 millimeters, or a negative 1.5 inches. So that's the scale of surface change shown on the map. You can, there are roads, there are roads plotted on that as well as the installation boundary for reference. And the faults are also shown. So there, there's three features on this that show subsidence. In the, very, in the north of the model domain, you'll see a label COSO. That's subsidence that's likely related to the geothermal plant or production. To the south of that, you'll see a red area that has a label SV1. That's subsidence bowl one. And that area also shows the epicenters associated with the uh, 1995 Ridgecrest earthquake. And you can see all those epicenters plot on that area of red, that subsidence bowl one. Further to the south, when you're getting closer to town, you see subsidence bowl two, SB2. That area right there is bounded by faults right there. The configuration of the extent of that red is following fault patterns. And then, oh, you, it might be difficult to see, but there's a purple line that's labeled snort. I just want to point this out. You see that vertical line? So north, that is the alignment of the supersonic naval ordnance research track. It's on base property. And of note, the, the southern end of that track is within sequence boundary two, or uh, I was working on something else earlier, same acronym, subsidence bowl two. And the northern part of it actually crosses the, the trace of the Little Lake Fault Zone. And I'll talk about the snort track or the snort alignment later, but I just wanted to point that out so you can see how that track, which is a little over four miles long, crosses some interesting features on these maps. So, yeah, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to clarify. So th these uh, changes were based on two INSAR measurements, is it? If I remember correctly, there was perhaps up to five layers that were analyzed between 1992 and 2000. And this is the, the average result of, of those layers. Layers, you're calling them. Okay. Yeah, the, it, yeah, there was, they were flown in 92 and another one in 94, so different years. Thank you. And the image on the right is between 2005 and 2010. And comparing that to the earlier period, you can see there's still subsidence going on up in Coso in the north. Uh, however, where the 1995 Ridgecrest earthquake swarm was, you can see that there's actually positive land surface changes. So there's a rebound essentially going on that is seismically related or tectonic. But then to the south, Subsidence ball two, you see there's continuing subsidence. Quick question. Quick question on the, uh, the INSAR analysis of surface change. Yes. Um, is there a way that these could possibly show the same coloring on that set? Because one high, high amount only goes to 18.9, but that same color 
is 63.5. Yeah, they're, they're not the exactly one, they're, the same. They're, they're quite different. So it looks like yeah. there was a whole massive upload change in the El Paso Basin set, but there wasn't much shifting. And then, yeah, you mentioned COSO. Of course, they're having some decreasing, right. dropping, but there's a whole lot more red. So it looks like it was more intense, but it was less because it only goes down to 23.7. That's right. The magnitude of surface change in the negative subsidence is less. That's yeah. Right. So yep. in SB1 location within the 2005 to 2010, uh, it only it did move back up by only a few uh, small amount of millimeters, 18.9. Yes. Whereas in the previous time frame, there was a massive drop. That's right. In that exact same zone, down to 38.3 millimeters right. on the minus set. That's so it's just trying to see and view and just not get those a little confused. Yeah, that's right. Was, yeah, that's right. So the red during, so that earthquake occurred during that period, captured between 92 2000. So you're seeing the surface, essentially the tectonic surface displacement associated with normal faulting from that. Uh, that and then it has reshifted as it's just simply naturally moving That's back right, yeah. There, you can look at it as elastic rebound mm -hmm. strain accumulation. And I'll, I'll show some, well, this, this is a good intro to some data collected at SNORT that actually shows that a tectonic signal very well. Thank you. You bet. All right, so so we looked at satellite-based surface changes on a valley-wide scale. On the left is a plot of elevation changes. Level line surveys performed along the snort alignment between 1952 and 2000. And a study by Zelmer and Ruckmore, they, they worked up level line data and showed that snort is essentially deforming from tectonics. And what's very interesting about this is on the y-axis, you'll see relative elevation change in millimeters from zero to 60, so that's positive. You interpret that as uplift. And then between zero and negative 60 millimeters, that's subsidence. That's on the y-axis. And the x-axis shows uh, distance from the south end of track in meters. Uh, you, you can think of that, of that as about four miles long. So what's what they demonstrated was that relative tectonic uplift occurs during stress buildup during periods with no seismic activity, and the dashed lines show that. So between 1952 and 1957, shown in green, which might be difficult to see, um, in 1977 to 1978, it's black, and then in 1984, or between 1984 and 1986, you'll see in red, which is actually the greatest. And that's all showing uplift. And the greater the value is the closer you're getting to the Little Lake Fault Zone. So at the, at the north end of the track, it's approaching the fault zone, essentially the shear zone. And that's happening aseismically. And then the subsidence they've showed occurs um, as relative tectonic subsidence during stress drops during magnitude five earthquakes. And that occurred, there was one in 1961, there's the one in 1982 previously described, and then in 1995. And you can see those are shown in solid lines and they all drop. So this is a very good example of such elastic strain accumulation. And I need to note that this is all relative elevations to zero. So, they, so that's how they can separate any uncertainties with absolute elevation changes of the surface. They're just focusing right along the alignment and they're seeing the tectonic signal. So in an attempt to evaluate if you could actually see a, an absolute elevation change signal, 
I went ahead and plotted the INSAR data along with the track alignment. And that's what's shown on the right plot, the upper one. The y-axis shows surface change in millimeters from negative 4 down to negative 36. And the x-axis is distance from south end of track, similar to the other plot. Here you'll note that the blue line between, is the INSAR data from 1992 to 2000. And that shows about negative 8 millimeters of surface change on the south end of the track. And you can see it slowly increase to the north. And then you'll note that it drops down a little bit towards the north end of the track. That's where it's approaching the Little Lake Fault Zone. And, that, and the 1995 earthquake occurred during this period. So it, it's, it's showing a tectonic signal there, as well as a subsidence signal in the south. Uh, the next period of INSAR data between 2005 and 2010, which is shown in green, you can see that there was about 11 millimeters of subsidence on the south end and a gradual decay of less to the north. And what's interesting is that you add the two, you sum up the two, and you can estimate the cumulative surface change, and that's what's shown in red. And that was up to 20 millimeters of subsidence in the south end of the track. And as a, an additional check on the resolution of the INSAR data, I was able to find absolute elevations taken in 1986 and 2000 at the Snort Monument Zero. And that's shown with a triangle. And you can see that the absolute elevation difference between the two monuments in two different periods is similar to the INSAR during that same period of about minus eight millimeters per year. And the plot right below it is, is essentially the subsidence rate in millimeters per year. And you can see that by the time you, between you get between 2005 and 2010, that you got up to about two millimeters per year of subsidence in the south end of the track. So overall, with those two plots, it shows or indicates progressive subsidence. You get, and you have greater values on the southern end near subsidence bowl two. And also there's a tectonic signal on the northern end as well. All right, so, so we saw some historical observations. So now there was an attempt to evaluate the distribution of subsidence in relation to the hydrogeology and the structure. Um, to do that, went ahead and, and plotted the area of that, that silt-rich lacustrine unit. And that's shown in white. I hope you can see that. There, can you see that? You can at least see the boundary of it through through the the subsidence bowl number two. Also shown are are the modeled faults. They're they're in orange. And on top of that, you'll see uh, simulated drawdown contours in feet. That's what's shown in black. And also, for reference, went ahead and, and plotted pump wells that had greater than 900 acre feet between 1992 and 2000, just to get an idea of how that correlates to uh, Kona depressions from the simulations. And one of the features that stands out to me is within subsidence bowl two, you'll see the margin of the fine grain unit and the faults actually coincide with the areas with the greatest subsidence. And um, 
plotted the same data on the INSAR map between 2005 and 2010. And also the, con the simulated contour con uh, intervals. And it shows essentially the same relation between the, the fine grain unit, the southern margin of that fine grain unit, the faults with the highest amount of subsidence. So, so that was for the two periods. So let's, let's understand what's going on through between 1992 and 2010. So, so essentially added those two images together and you can see that in blue, there was positive surface change up to 62 millimeters. That equates to about 2.4 inches. And a negative surface change of about negative 45 millimeters, which is about 1.7 inches of subsidence. Also shown are those simulated contours between or drawdown contours between 1992 and 2010. And I also went ahead and pl plotted the production wells shown in with red stars. You'll see wells that had greater than 20,000 acre feet between 1992 and 2010. In green are wells that had greater than 10,000 acre feet between that period. And shown in black with black stars are wells that had greater than 4,000 acre feet. What the model shows is are three distinct areas with cones of depression of up to 26, perhaps even 30 feet of drawdown. Um, so to understand what the surface near production wells are doing. Went ahead and, and plotted the simulated drawdown versus time, but also on the secondary y-axis showed the total surface change from the INSAR data. And the plot in the upper left shows pump well ID 8 shows that there was up to about six millimeters of subsidence in that area of, of that cone of depression that shows about 18 feet of drawdown. To the south of that, that other plot, which is at a pump well that had greater than 20,000 acre feet, you can see that about 16 millimeters of subsidence occurred in that area. And then to the east in the area that's within the subsidence fault too and near faults and in the area that had the fine grain hydrogeologic unit, you can see that there was about 19, close to 20 millimeters of subsidence in that area. So in summary, as we all know, this is a tectonically and geomorphically active area along the east side of the Sierra Nevadas. Both the fine-grained lacustrian and the interbedded fine-grained alluvial units are prone to compaction when groundwater levels fall below historical levels. The spatial distribution of greatest subsidence coincides with overlapping lateral margins of the interbedded fine-grained units and the location of faults. Subsidence up to 45 millimeters, essentially two inches, occurred between 1992 and 2010 in areas with up to 18 feet of drawdown. The subsidence rate of up to six millimeters, essentially a quarter of an inch per year, corresponded to a drawdown rate of up to 2.3 feet per year between 1992 and 2010. And Taking into account tectonics, there's good temporal correspondence between subsidence and drawdown across the groundwater basin.
Could you, could you explain how you took that into account? Uh, you said taking into effect tectonics. Yes. Yes. Um, there is good temporal correlation between pumping and right. Um, right. Right. It would be the proximity to the faults. So the further away you are from the faults, the less interaction you have with 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 that shear zone. So if you had a pumping well that was hundreds of feet from the fault or within the shear zone, whatever changes in the in the, the surface, it, it would be there would be more uncertainty if it's related to drawdown or tectonics itself. Yeah, I was just wondering how you isolate it because obviously if you're adjacent to the fault, we're talking about six millimeters per year. Say the wells that you highlighted over on Green, uh, Brown Road, you're looking at 0. 0.6 millimeters a year. How much of that 0. 0.6 did you isolate with the tectonics? That was six millimeters. Yeah, at the, yeah. At the tecto over on Brown Road. Yeah, yeah. It's a, but still, it's very fine. Yes. Yep. So right now, the, what I have is the difference at snort, because you can see four miles away from the shear zone you got up to 20 millimeters of subsidence. But on the north end, you had less. And that signal you do see in the north end, you can attribute that to tectonics. So potentially that could provide you your range of tectonic subsidence-related surface change. I, to, to actually put a, a boundary on what is tectonic. I understand how qualitatively that might be done. I, I'm just using the example of, if you go to the previous figure, Say that the wells, um, pump well ID 8. Yes. So you've got about six millimeters over a period of 10 years. That's right. So 0. 0.6 millimeters, 0. 0.6 millimeters. Okay, yeah, all right, for a rate, yeah. Whereas over in the fault area, you've got six millimeters per year. Yeah. So how much of the 0. 0.6 millimeters per year is tectonic and how much is pumping related? There would have to be an analysis that takes into consideration distance from the fault zone. You can see at pump ID8, you're further away than you are from 26. Yeah, and my point being, the analysis might indicate that all 0.6 is tectonic related. That, that would have to be performed. Yeah, We'd have so to, take to conclude that the pumping is related to the subsidence would seem to be premature when we haven't been able to isolate what Fair portion enough. is pumping Fair and what portion is, is tectonic. Yeah. yeah well, and I, go ahead. Yeah, and along that line, uh, I, I guess what, one of the things that kind of made me curious was that the uh, subsidence rate declined in the second five years, and yet the pumping, I don't think, declined. I think, if anything, the pumping may have gone up. So... That doesn't really correlate. Well, only if we have uniform hydrogeologic units. There's always the, in fact, there's always the, the potential for differential subsidence that's related to the thickness of underlying fine grain units. So in one area, you can have a very thick fine grain unit, and if your drawdown is consistent, you get compaction at X amount, but somewhere else where it's interbedded finer grain fine units, uh, the amount of compaction could be less and, and the rate would be different. So it always comes back to the com complexity of, of the hydrogeology. Right, but I'm just looking at the bowl, the second bowl, uh -huh. and, and that appeared to, the rate appeared to decline in that area. Yes, it did. It doesn't and have that tectonic signal. Right, but I don't think the lithology in that area is, I mean, that, that's a, you're on the edge of the lake bed, as you said, so it seems like if you're looking at the same area that, and you get a decline, it, it's not really correlating with pumping then, mm -hmm. in, unless there's something we don't know about the hydrogeology there. That's, that's, that's which, is, one of, which is a good inference. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so more, I mean, it's like, it's like uh, I guess what you said was more analysis uh, would be good to really 
And, and remember, this the uh, 2010 was the last image for right. NSAR analysis. So we've there's essentially nine years of data that we haven't looked at. So, right. so I, I guess I'm going to go back to the original. I think, Tim, you brought this up when we were talking about the sustainable management criteria. You know, we kind of went yeah. through the list. Water levels we, we agreed on. Reduction in storage we agreed on. Seawater intrusion I think we agreed is not an issue. Degraded water quality maybe. Um, depletion of interconnected surface water, groundwater. I, I, that's debatable to me still, but, you know, we've got to kind of dive into that a little bit. And my initial reaction was why are we even looking at subs land subsidence based on are there any significant and unreasonable, you know, um, issues now? And I, I don't know of any, at least traditionally looking at wells that are collapsing, um, infrastructure issues. Right. So I'm kind of like, are we making uh, sort of a mountain out of a molehill here? Or maybe are there certain areas where we need to focus in? But I mean, there's, you know, maybe the snort area, if there's, you know, been physical issues that have caused problems, I don't know enough about the technology. But everywhere else, I, I don't see any issues, you know, again, going back to significant and unreasonable. I, I don't see it. So I don't know. I mean, I'd like to get some discussion going here because we do we want to kind of go down this rabbit hole or what do we want to do? Yeah, that's a good one. And, and I guess the first question is, has the snort track been uh, affected to the uh, significantly? Absolutely. Well, yeah. Track. Yeah, but is it related to pumping? We just heard it's related to tectonic activity. Uh, the northern end of the track. Right. The southern end has a signal that's comparable to the subsidence bolt, too. One, one thing that you guys may not all be aware of, we talk about historical subsidence. Uh, and, of course, our INSAR data and, and the SNORT data is all relatively modern. Um, but the Bowman Ranch, which is where the modern-day Walmart is located, is in a depression, if you look at it. They've actually filled that to a fair degree. Um, when we first came here, and I've actually looked for some photographs, and I haven't found them, but we're looking through mountains of photographs, um, there were wells that were connected, that were associated with, I should say, the Bowman Ranch and the other alfalfa ranches that were along Bowman Road that um, by the late 60s, the subsidence had um, become totally obvious. There were many line shaft turbine pumps sitting on top of casing that was well above ground level. You can see from Bowman Road. Um, the early day um, agriculture, the 1910 agriculture, much of it was um, a long brown road at about Lee Lighter. <clears throat> and if you go up Brown Road today, there is a, a zone that's about maybe a mile and a half or so long that dips down. That um, low area uh, is, you look, take a look at a topo map, it's anomalous. And I don't have any evidence that that's pumping subsidence, but that's coincident with where the early farming did occur. Um, one thing, Steve, you, you don't, in your um, map that you show lacustrine deposits, you're, you're showing uh, basically superficial deposits, but the uh, lacustrine deposits at depth go much further to the west and the, the North Brown Road area has about a 1,600 foot thick section of organic clay. Right. Um, Katzenstein's analysis uh, was incomplete there because the ground surface had been disturbed to the point that you had no reference that was stable enough to use, I think was the, That's what the yeah, reason that he yes. offered. And one thing that would be useful, I think, would be to, uh, maybe with some of our money, would be to establish some uh, reference um, monuments, uh, a few different places that where they don't exist now, and, and the North Brown Road area would be one of the places, I think, that would be useful. 
for monitoring, is that? For, for monitoring, yes, for direct monitoring. Right. Uh, just to follow up, Don, is there any uh, actual data on these wells that you're talking about? Uh, photos or anything that well that are you talking about the wells that the, the, the um, pump motors sitting up on casing yeah yeah that you just well referenced. they um, I looked through probably 2,000 photographs uh, in the last couple of weeks and looking for a number of things and that was one of them I assume that I probably did take a picture because it was pretty <clears throat> obvious uh, what one's looking at um, those photographs, you know, somebody has photographs, but it may take more digging. I may have them myself, but it's not directly available. Some of the old uh, wells on North Brown Road, cable-tooled wells that were went back to 1910, had uh, evidence of subsidence, but it wasn't so spectacular as having, um, you know, line shaft motors on top of casing uh, 10 feet above the ground. Just as a, as a sort of a point of comparison, um, I know some of us work in the Central Valley. Obviously, Eddie and I do a lot of work there. Um, and, you know, whether 0.6 millimeters a year is significant when in the Central Valley we're dealing in levels of subsidence that are 100 times that. That's right, yeah. Six centimeters a year. In some cases, more than that. And they don't think that's significant. <laughs> in some, 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 some GSAs, I would, that might be questionable. But in relative terms, right. to other areas of the state, the substance here is probably a, you know, two orders of magnitude low. Okay. This also reminds me of Tucson, Arizona, where they've had some massive INSAR stuff done by the University of Arizona, and they showed complete changes over a 10-year time frame of 40, 50 feet right. dropping. And that's a much, much greater magnitude than 10 to 15 millimeters. That's right. yeah. I, I just think you, we need to really think hard about how to incorporate that into the GSP because if you wanted to, let's say, subsidence is an issue in and around the snort area and, and it's being targeted that pumping could be causing it, what are the wells that surround the snort area and how does that impact management right. issues? I mean, you've you got to start thinking about these things, not just big picture. you got to sort of like focus it on the areas that need it. Pumping okay. a lot of the water down away makes me think we would see a massive and a larger uh, impact on subsidence versus just the tectonic side that we see here. So, again, it's my opinion. This doesn't appear to have be affected by how much is already being pumped away. This is an impact that's coming from tectonic seismic stuff. Uh, not all. Not all. Of it. No, of course not. Yeah, I'm not going to debate that anymore. No. But 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 <laughs> yeah. the, you can't the, just blame well, it all on Paul. What what I have a, a I guess you could say a concern with in terms of uh, being on the tack and looking at the GSP and the fact that there are such limited funds to do things in the future, and when you start talking about um, INSAR data, INSAR data, DW, the Department of Water Resources is supposedly making free. I don't know about the evaluation of that data, but I think that's one thing that we need to find out. Is, is DWR going to evaluate that data? And if not, then what's the cost associated with evaluating that data? Is it fifty to to $100,000 each time you do it, something like that? Because I know it's not cheap. Right. Then you talk about extensometers on the other end of the scale, right. and they're, you know, a couple million bucks each. And so how, how is this money going to get spent in the future, and what are the real priorities for the basin, I think, is something that at some point the tax should weigh in on from a technical perspective. What do we see being the highest technical priorities? And then, you know, at least we have our, our uh, whatever it is, opinion in. And, you know, somebody else decides, but at least from a technical perspective, we have the opportunity to do that. Well, is it reasonable? There's your, there's your answer. Is it reasonable? Maybe it helps put it in perspective what we're trying to do right now. Um, as part of the GSP, we want to include an evaluation of, of, of subsidence, and, and I, that's what DRI was brought right. on board for, and, right. and I, I really, I, I was very impressed. So it's not 20 feet. That, that's, that's, it's what not, no, we're, it's, that's what we're doing I for really the GSP. Appreciate. That's what's going to go in the GSP is what we're observing now. I don't see, we're not seeing 
um, subsidence to be a controlling factor in developing a sustainability plan right now. Um, but subsidence, uh, the, I, I foresee our next step, which is what we want the TAC involved in for sure, is certainly comments on the work that's already been done, but what, what Steve was headed to, which, which was the next thing, which is possible future monitoring approaches and where we're going to go from that. And that's going to be done after the GSP. It won't be a part of the GSP. So I don't see it as having an impact on what we do or don't do with the GSP. But monitoring going forward, I think, is something we really want to look at and, and get input on. And we certainly want to get input from the Navy on that. And the Navy's expressed concerns. And the Navy's expressed concerns, this isn't the forum, but right now, also with um, potential brackish water pumping. Um, it's going to be in that area. So those are all down the road, but this is really a documentation of what we know. Let's try to make sure we're all on the same page with what we see and then look at what we're going to do going forward. Yeah, that sounds fair, Steve. Um, the only thing is with the GSP, you have to identify your data gaps and how you're going to fill those yes. data gaps. Yeah. So, And that, I guess both well, that could be an open-ended question. Yeah. We either think we need to do some kind of monitoring or we don't, yeah. or some range of that, and yeah. what kind of monitoring yeah. it could be, yeah. yeah. And we'll watch you guys in on that for sure, okay. the whole tack, for sure. But thank you, Steve. That was very, very good. Very well done. Yeah, I really appreciate the level of effort that went into this and the results. Nice work. Thank you. Can, can, can we ask him to finish? Like, maybe I was talking and wasn't paying attention, but on the, the future approaches of modeling, I mean, of monitoring, I mean, do you have a, based on your experience, do you feel like NSAR, an NSAR survey might be good enough for the next five to ten years and avoid excitometers, or what, what do you, what's your thoughts on well, that? Well, in terms of cost, it, it's, it's more cost effective and you have a greater footprint. Right. And okay. you can evaluate. Okay. You know, what's Great. going on? We would bring those thoughts to you guys. Obviously, sure. get input. We wouldn't just stick it in. Right. With what we're going to go. All right. Thank you. The only only issue I see with trying to use INSAR in a general sense here is the North Brown Road area, and um, perhaps the southeast. If there is brackish water pumping in either of those areas, and we already, I, I you're, you'd have to take my word for it that 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 depression and the and the uh, effects from it there at the Walmart site where Bowman Ranch connected. Um, but that's essentially, if, as I understand it, in, in the general area of where um, the brackish water pumping might occur. The others in the northwest, uh, again, um, in both areas having very disturbed areas that we don't have uh, good reference surfaces to work with. That was the point of my yep. wanting yep, right. to, to install yep. some. And, and just for just for continuing the same point, I, I call them pep talks. I was given a, a, a very good pep talk by the Navy about those concerns. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's very cost effective. Yeah, what you're suggesting. Yeah, absolutely. I'm talking about level lines and. Um, you guys are pointing out that you know we what we're seeing here so far, except for snort and its sensitivities, which are pretty extreme. Um, we're seeing pretty small changes. But I also point out to you, and uh, I won't go through it again, that in an earlier time there were effects going on that we can see the result of today, and they're not just millimeters. They're not 40 feet either. Are there any public comments or questions? Uh, I have a. I, okay. That's a no. Um, back to us then. Go ahead. <laughs> back to us. Is uh, that the with subsidence, there uh, was a Navy proposal, and I don't know, Steve, Stefan, if you can address um, what, what the Navy's plans are for COSO royalty money and looking at things. Right. Uh, well, most of you are aware of the NDAA, uh, uh, National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, Dave Janis has been working on that. Uh, Scott O'Neill. Um, the Navy did 
submit a request for funding for one of, uh, generally one of the projects that the GA had uh, requested of the Navy to look into funding. Uh, we submitted a request for that, um, for funding for one of those projects, namely um, the subsidence project. One of those was subsidence. There was, I think, three others that dealt with monitoring well installation. Uh, we, we selected the subsidence portion of that. Um, I will say that uh, we, uh, in looking at the scope of work that was requested by the GA, um, we talked with DRI and, and uh, with Stetson about alternatives. And what we're requesting funding for is an ex expansion of the network of monitoring points, the uh, geodetic monitoring points. We have an existing network of it, and that's what uh, Steve was looking at. Uh, and also additional uh, INSAR flights as being more cost effective than the four extensiometer points that were uh, recommended. I think we need to look at get a broader uh, idea of potential changes. Um, we don't know. Uh, I, I've heard that we might hear back by August, but obviously that is not a guarantee, so we'll just wait and see when we hear back. So that would be in terms of filling in data gaps and um, adding in a, be a more sense of some of the areas that Don has talked about and just being aware of the potential for subsidence given the clays in the basin. Thanks. So let me just make sure I understand. Has the Navy made the final decision that they want to do a move subsidence above some of the drilling of some of the wells that we proposed, the GA proposed? Yes, the Navy... Has that final? Has there been a final decision from the yes. Navy's perspective? That has there is, been no discussion with the GA on that? Well, yes. We, we, had, we actually had a very short time frame to uh, make a decision on what to apply for funding for. There were the four that, options. But that, that time frame is really based on the Navy driving a time frame. That's true. So... Uh, so anyways, what I'd like to suggest is that we set up a meeting where we can actually sit down and discuss the projects and the time frame. Because I think it's all just been set up unilaterally. I haven't really had any conversation with the GA on that as far as the follow-up goes. Yeah, we, um, uh, Commander Benson was basically given a, a deadline for returning a request for the funding. It was uh, initially, it was in a matter of three days, I think, is what... Yeah, right. <laughs> And, and the, as far as I'm concerned, the Navy's had nine months to really work on this. So uh, I would like to have a conversation with the Navy on this. Sure. <laughs> are there some comments, <laughs> questions? Come on up and just let us know who you are. John Kersey, Community Planning Liaison for NOS China Like We got the guidance, unfortunately, by the time we received it. We had literally days to put it in, or we didn't have a project to even submit. We would have missed the deadline outright. And I'm saying that there's other ways to challenge that guideline. So, well, you, you are welcome to uh, see what we can do. We can sit you down with Commander Benson, but that was put forth. It was communicated to the GA, and we worked with Stetson accordingly. Okay, thank you for that information. Yeah. Yes. Uh, West Cassis, I did have a question. I noticed that uh, uh, in, in the time frames when there was more subsidence, there, was also, there were also earthquakes. So is it possible that, that the next earthquake might accelerate some subsidence due to water that's already been removed? It's just a technical question. <clears throat> that's a very good question. Um, there's always secondary effects. You can get soft sediment deformation or liquefaction from when you have earthquakes and unconsolidated sediment. Now, you, get, you typically get that when your sediment's saturated. Yes. However, 
when this fine grain material is dewatered, what are the thresholds that actually initiate compaction? There could be a seismic load could initiate the compaction in addition to the overburden pressure. So it's a very good question. Thank you. Any other public comments or questions? Okay. If we're set with that one, then we can move on to 3D, the GSP report update. Yeah, I think that's Heather. It's going to be fairly short. I think. Okay. Yes, it will be very brief. Um, previously in a, um, last month's TAC meeting and at the last board meeting, uh, Steve Johnson and Jeff Helsley have reported that some frustration due to some delays um, in our process and our timeline. And likewise, we do have delays in getting uh, chapters to you, as you have noticed. Um, currently, we are in some final review and revision for Section 3 of the GSP, and we intend to get that to you, the TAC, and, and the PAC, and the public as well um, by end of next week. And if we're going a little bit out of order, we should be getting Section 2 to you um, in about two weeks as well. So there's been a little bit of delay, and we know that this is important, and we're trying to get this out to you. Just because just I have a quick question. So I'm familiar with the DWR's annotated outline. So ch Chapter 3 is what? We actually split up um, yeah. what they had as Chapter 2 into two sections, okay. plan area and, sec and basin settings. So okay. Section 3 would be basin settings. Okay. I was just thinking Chapter 3 like, was like sustainable management criteria. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> now we just wrote that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any other uh, comments or questions from uh, the committee on this? Okay, I think we can move on to the next little part of this item three. This is now E, and this is on the uh, actions modeling scenario. Sure, sure. Thank you, Adam. Heather, can you uh, flip the deals? Because I don't have up there. Just when, when we need to. We don't we'll need to for a few minutes. Um, yes, and, and Heather's talking. Uh, she expressed some concern, and I want to make sure because I don't want to leave her hanging out on that um, about where we are on the schedule. And we are we are rapidly behind schedule and I think we've mentioned that before um, at the last TAC meeting at the end I expressed some concerns about where we were um, we're a little better right now than we were last time I expressed concerns and I guess that was the first televised TAC meeting and so I, I heard a lot back about that little discussion about where we are um, we're a little better than we were and I'm gonna try to go through that right now um, but we're still in an area of trying to figure out where we're going because um, some things have come together some things have sort of collided and I want to I, I want to try and give as best information as I can to all the audience stakeholders and the TAC uh, about where we are um, without um, divulging too much about what was discussed in board closed session and what was being discussed at the attorney's allocation meetings, which I'm participating in both. But anyway, um, we, over the last, when I started to express some concerns about where we were, which was before the last TAC meeting, we were on, in the process of uh, developing what I would call an implementation plan around modeling scenarios. We'd seen a lot of information uh, we had presented to you folks model runs showing the baseline model, which is if we didn't do anything for the next 70 years, you know, what would happen. Um, there were some real concerns expressed with what that model showed, and again, we expressed it as a model, and it's based upon the well information that we have, and, and, and uh, it showed some concerns going out if we don't do anything that a lot of wells would be impacted. In fact, the model started to crash a little bit toward the end. We showed that, but again, that was the baseline. Doing the baseline model, we got information from all of the pumpers, and we said, what do you plan to do if we don't do anything? And we got some pretty big numbers. We put those in. So our pumping was really on the order of 32 to 35,000 acre-feet a year going forward, or even a little more. So it was a baseline model based upon the criteria we set. Um, we also ran two model scenarios that we ran through the TAC. We ran through the modeling ad hoc committee and presented results for those. Um, and I think those are good models. Those were good models. Those were really, I think, real strong attempts at trying to drive an implementation of plan with um, technical input and, and trying to divide, decide where we were going to go with the technical results on an implementation plan. 
So I think every, we, we I just want to say we're certainly capable of doing it, and we're certainly trying to drive an implementation plan um, using uh, technical information, technical results. Um, so that's that's where where we've been. Now we got we got a bit we got a bit derailed, and I mentioned this at the last meeting. Uh, we got a little off 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 schedule, off track. Um, because primarily um, we put together what I thought was a sort of a, a compromise uh, implementation plan around the first two model run scenarios um, that basically, and um, well, I'll just go through, just walk through it. I'm being, trying to be very careful not to t call anybody out who directed us one way or the other where the concerns were. So I'll just tell you where, where it was. Um, we put a, an implementation plan together. Um, that we thought was a good compromise that involves some period of time of deferred uh, ramp downs of pumping, followed by some pumping um, that would go on and some anticipations of imp imported water arriving at some point in some levels, similar to the model runs one and two. And um, I think based upon model runs one and two and the baseline model run, um, there were concerns expressed by a lot of people, and a, a lot of people here have heard those concerns. Um, uh, Nick Panzer has expressed concerns from my first day here about um, health and safety, and the uh, ba basic needs of the community ought to be health and safety and not go any further. Um, we've got, obviously, the base has Federal Reserve rights. We've got lots of other things coming into play about, about what needs to happen in this basin. Um, at the same time, um, working on the technical work, and I think we, and I've, I've expressed this before, I think we got started late on the attorney's allocation meetings. Um, we've had about five meetings, five, four, five, six, five meetings, allocation meetings. These are held at uh, Keith Lemieux's office um, in Thousand Oaks, a whole group of attorneys. Uh, they're run primarily by uh, special counsel Markman, Jim Markman. Um, I actually asked to participate. At some point, I wish maybe I didn't ask to participate, but but they they said, "Yeah, you should be there." And 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 now I asked not to go, and they tell me now you have to be there, um, because what's happened is the discussions at the allocation meetings, and I don't want to discuss details because they're not really privileged, but there are certain conditions, and I, don't, I certainly don't want to want, want to break any confidence about me me being there. But the allocation meetings are, 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 are progressing at a certain rate and not progressing in some areas. And we have the technical on the other side. And I've expressed to everybody before, because they put me in both places, uh, put us in both places on the technical side, um, and also put us on the, uh, allocate the legal side with the allocation work and trying to come up with a, a negotiated approach with the, uh, with the attorneys for all, all, all of the representatives. And I'll say there's two areas of representation that really aren't there. One is de minimis well owners uh, and mutuals are not there, and small ag is not there. Uh, but I can tell you, I, I just give you uh, uh, a heads up that you are, your concerns are being considered and are being discussed. There's not an attorney because they don't have an attorney uh, on record to, to come to those things, so, so they don't have an attorney represented. But, but all the other pumping interests are represented, including the Navy. Um, but but your interests are being considered. They, well, believe me, they are. So, in trying to work with the uh, attorneys allocation group and the technical side, um, we were we were getting closer closer and closer together on where we were going to go, and then it effectively stopped. Um, and that's what happened about a month and a half ago, um, with some concerns expressed by um, um, certain board members, um, and, um, not certain, many of the board members, um, which resulted in some meetings between our office and Indian Wells Valley Groundwater Authority staff, including attorneys from all three agencies, to try and figure out what's the best way to go. Um, we came up with some ideas with um, an understanding. I'm, I'm not going to suggest that there was any brown concerns or anything, but understanding that the attorneys representing the agencies represented by this authority, the attorneys have a pretty good handle on what their board members are looking to have happen. Um, that includes uh, uh, Kern County, Water District, and the city. Um, even though we're, we don't have the board members there, we have the attorneys. The attorneys know where, where their board members are headed and what needs to be done. So we have good input on, on where we need to go. Anyway, having meetings with these groups, 
we've given, we, were, we, we came up with some, some direction that um, was developed by that group, not directly by, by the water resources manager, but with that group, with everybody there, um, understanding that this was going to go to the board. So we put together some scenarios, some ideas on how we're going to go forward. There were a couple things put together. Um, Special Counsel Markman has sent out a memo from the, the meeting we had last Friday that's out. I, I know it's going to the PAC. I think, David, you have it. I don't know if the folks here have seen it, but it summarizes what happened at that meeting um, um, on where they're going to go forward. But the couple of things that, have ha that, that, that went on with our staff meeting with the Indian Wells, Wells, Indian Wells Valley Groundwater Authority and our office with the staff and the attorneys is that two directions were developed. One was uh, a legal direction with a special counsel Markman addressing the board on legal, alter legal uh, options available to the board that was developed at that meeting. The other thing that was developed was, and closely associated with those legal options to go forward, were modeling scenarios to go forward is what we should be doing. So we developed those, we said that's fine, and uh, it was agreed that we would bring those to closed session at the board, last board meeting, which is two weeks ago, um, which we did. Um, it was the morning closed session, the hour and a half, the long morning closed session. A lot of you folks were here waiting for us to come out. It was the morning closed session, and um, we did get direction from the board. Uh, Jim Martman got direction for the attorney's meeting, which happened on Friday. We got direction on model runs. So that's how we got to where we're at. Um, we presented the alternative model runs that were on the table based upon, as I've mentioned, uh, internal meetings with Indian, Ve Indian Wells Valley Groundwater Authority staff, the including the attorneys, and our office. That's how these were developed. So um, not knowing how all this works and, 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 and how we need to go forward and not go forward, I asked permission to present it here. <laughs> Because I didn't know where there was, because we obviously presented them in closed session. It was done, we, we talked about it at the attorney's meetings, but at some point they needed to come out. And so um, we prepared this uh, PowerPoint and, and distributed it amongst legal counsel to make sure it was okay um, that we present where we're headed right now so that everybody knows because the TAC needs to know. Um, you will recall that in the process of all that, I missed a point here, in the process of all this, um, we were having ad hoc modeling um, scenario, modeling committee, ad hoc group uh, developing modeling scenarios. Some of you were involved in that. And that's how we developed the first two scenarios. Um, as a result of some of the things that occurred at the attorney's allocation meeting that were intended to um, move into an ad hoc modeling meeting and model runs and things that were, were discussed that were going to happen didn't happen. Both the attorneys, the uh, attorneys allocation meeting was canceled and the modeling ad hoc meeting was canceled and that's when we actually had our internal staff meeting was okay, we're not going forward, we need to do something else. So that's how these scenarios were developed. Um, I, we, we moved this last to the agenda because we're hoping you guys were all tired and we could just get through this and get out of here <laughs> because I'm afraid if we did it at the beginning we might never get out of here. Uh, so that's, there was some logic in putting it last um, and that's where we are. Um, so I'm just going to walk through um, what I wanted to present, and we can certainly ask questions. We probably ought to wait till the end because this isn't very long. Um, but basically, these are the GSP Sustainable Management Action Modeling Scenarios. These are three scenarios that we are authorized. We don't have budget for that. Uh, we only have budget for two more. These are the three scenarios we were, we were authorized to uh, pull together. Um, at the end, remind me if I forget. I'll tell you what the schedule is going forward because I don't want to do it at the beginning. Um, but we're, our intent is to get these pulled together, produce the results, and take them back to um, uh, the board, probably in closed session, and then get direction on what to do from there. And our goal is to try and do all of that and come back and talk to you folks at the next TAC meeting. That's the, that's the goal, big picture. How, how we're going to get there, I'm not sure, but that's the big picture. Um, so three model run scenarios were developed. Board authorized them. Um, let's, uh, let's see. I've already talked about all this, but I'm going to do it real quick. Coordination with the, I've talked about the coordination uh, that we've had between um, the technical group, you folks, ad hoc, and the legal allocation groups. Um, the impasse was in March and April. That's the impasse where we were trying to develop, um, really, really trying to develop what I call an implement, implementation plan. We're still trying to develop an implementation plan. I think Jean was exactly right when she said um, 
Um, these milestones, thresholds, how we're gonna, how we're gonna measure these thresholds, uh, whether they come before or after a model run. Um, typically, we would have liked to have developed those after a model run and development of an implementation plan and to see where we're at and then develop the thresholds. Uh, I'm not sure they're, they're gonna happen together. And it's not really clear in our minds how we're gonna pull those together, but we know we have to do that. So, so we're following a certain direction to, to try to keep this moving forward. So anyway, the impasse occurred when we tried to develop an imp implementation plan and um, uh, the board wasn't real, real happy with the direction it was going, so we, we had to stop. Um, I did express the concern, let me back up just real quick. I expressed the concerns at the April TAC meeting, I told you that. Uh, they suspended the attorney's allocation meetings and the modeling act, I told you about that. We did have an attorney's meeting and that information is out. So, the next one. Okay, um, I wanted to put this in because there are several things very, very important things that are on the table that are driving where the uh, board is going. And understanding while we are the technical group, water resources manager, um, we can't put together a GSP uh, um, uh, uh, the successful unless we get it approved by the board. So we obviously have to bring this to the board. So we are trying to work with the board on where we're headed on developing this GSP. I want to mention some things because all of these have been talked about, but I want to mention because they do kind of stack up. Um, the impasse factors, the impasse factors that stop the implementation plan are essentially these, okay? Uh, the need to maximize conservation of basin storage. There's been a real strong emphasis on what the water we have in basin storage being the reserve basin storage for this basin going forward until we have an alternative source. Simple as that. Uncertainty of imported water replacement storage. We believe that there is a very good chance we're going to be able to bring imported water to this basin. We wouldn't be recommending hiring Capital Core and those folks if we didn't feel that way. Um, we believe there's a very good opportunity. We have a lot of people, very important and smart people, telling us that it's a, it's a crapshoot at best to get imported water in this basin. So um, the board is leaning toward the conservative and the assumption that we may not get imported water in this basin. So that's one of the, the areas the board has very big concerns on. The other part of that is replacement of storage. Um, there's been discussions about what it will cost if we decide to or wish to or need to replace storage that we remove because we develop a plan that doesn't conserve the water we have in reserve and storage. Um, those numbers are all over the place. We put together numbers for the TAC as part of our, Im our import of water study of somewhere between two, three, two and three, uh, two and three thousand dollars an acre foot for projects, whether it's LADWP or AVEC. The numbers vary, but those are round numbers. We now have somebody working on that. They'll be better, but we all know it's not going to be cheap. So the board is very concerned about if we're going to replace that water in storage at some point, it's very, very expensive. So that's an issue that's, that's got us stop, slowed down. Owens Valley, LADWP. LADWP, we have a member on the board. Um, Matt, Matt Kingsley is on the board. Um, he's expressed, he expressed it at the board meeting. He expressed strong concerns, as did John Vallee, who was sitting in his spot. Very strong concerns that Owens Valley, um, uh, Inyo County, um, will be in strong opposition to any imported water from Owens Valley to Indian Wells Valley, uh, especially groundwater. And he expressed other concerns about surface water, but he specifically uh, expressed major concerns, litigation um, uh, related to moving groundwater into this basin. And he, they've also expressed very clearly that those concerns are made much stronger if any of that water that might be imported to this basin um, would be used. And it doesn't have to go directly to agriculture if it was done to support ag because of their concerns in the Owens Valley about all of the ag that's been fouled up there in order to try to get that basin back into balance. So those are the concerns. Um, so anyway, that's Owens Valley. Um, opposition is, is, is there and, and it could get worse as we go forward. Um, understanding that our plan, and, 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 and this is the simple side, but I, I'm just gonna try to say it before somebody else does, um, our plan is never to, it was never to take water from Owens Valley. It was always to exchange water with Owens Valley. So it's not, it's not a taking, it's an exchange. Um, that's been explained. I just want everybody to understand. That's been explained. Um, 
it, it didn't help. It didn't really help us much in the conversation, even though that's, that's the direction we are going. We're not stopping. We're still going. Capital Corps is moving forward. They'll have a report at the next board meeting. So the next one, uh, potential irreversible loss of basin storage, high cost of replacement water. I've kind of talked about that already, but the board talks about um, the irre irreversibility of re removing any more reserves from this basin. Uh, reserve storage needed for potential base demand increase, a demand increase. The discussion is out there about the base. We all recognize the base has a, uh, has a uh, Federal Reserve right. Uh, we also all recognize that if there is some kind of an international crisis, some kind of a reason for the base to ramp up activities, um, that the base has the right and they will uh, increase activities and increase pumping. That will happen. Um, the board is also con uh, concerned about the effect of that being um, regardless of what sustainability plan we put together, um, unless we have a lot imported water available to us, um, if that happens, it will likely uh, add to the depletion of our reserves because we are not we're not currently planning a sustainability plan around some multiple years of quadrupling, tripling, or whatever it is of the uh, of the water pumping by the base. So that's a concern. Um, actual and potential impacts to shallow wells, we actually talked about that here today, both with uh, water quality, pumping, um, pumping cost, and, and subsidence. We talked about subsidence. I don't think it's huge, but, but we put it in there. Um, and then the last thing that is being discussed, and this is pretty frank, and I don't want, this is not to call out ag in any way. I like ag. I like food. I like to grow food. I, we, we like food, and we support ag. We're up here trying, trying to get solutions, so this is no way. I like Derek. We're good friends, I think. So... He's here. The other guys aren't, <laughs> but we do have met Mojave. I like pistachios too, so so that's all good. I love it. But <laughs> anyway, um, the discussion is. And I'm going to be frank because, and I ran this by the attorneys, and they said, "Let me do this." I said, "If egg must fallow, the questions they're asking is, why wait? Why should they fallow ten years from now? If they're going to fallow, why don't they fallow now and leave the water in storage?" That's a question that's being asked. That's what the board is having to address, and there's people asking the board that. So these are the reasons why they stopped us from an implementation plan. These are all the reasons why they stopped us and made us back up. Okay? So, uh, go to the next one. Okay. Um, I put this in just for a characterization of kind of where the, where the board is looking at things. Uh, re minimum water uses. Um, estimated basic health and safety. This is the Nick Panzer. Um, they probably, we penciled it out. We've never really run it based upon state guidelines and per capita and all of us, but, but we've run it with the Navy there, with de minimis there, and the ability to control your pumping. Um, we believe it probably exceeds the 7650. Quick question. Sure. Does, does that include the golf course and the Tui Chub? The, the base, the uh, uh, minimum health? No. Okay. This wouldn't. Health and safety. The, the only reason I put this in here, Tim, is to emphasize that even if we try to get down to bare minimum requirements with the Navy and de minimis, a little hard to control uh, the de minimis users and stuff, uh, we're very likely exceeding the safe yield. Maybe not by much, but yeah, we're, yeah. we're no, up there. I, I, it's you you, you don't it's a concern. No, so, no, I just so we need, we, and I've expressed this here before, there's a, there's a desperate need for import of water for this community to continue in, 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 a, in a viable way going forward. Um, current domestic only plus Navy uses, you know, we just put them down up there about a little over 10,000 acre feet. So quite a bit over, over our sustainability, our safe, we we'll call it safe yield, replenishment yield. Um, there's been a lot of discussion, and I want to make sure I qualify this. Navy reserve rights, um, we've got, right now we're using a little over 2,000 acre foot. You see what we got there, uh, Navy's 2,041. Right now we're using that. Historic records show Navy being well over 5,000 acre feet back when there was a lot more activity, a lot more, a lot more uh, personnel lived on base. There were actually commercial activities on base. Um, um, th there was more in here, but it got, got taken out. Um, so I'm just going to say it anyway. <laughs> I got taken out by attorneys, so I'll say it anyway. Um, uh, there was more in here. Some of that is related to uh, economic studies that have been done relating the economic value of the base to the community. Of, of over 80% of the economic economic impacts to the community is about 80% 80, 80 so if you apply anything close to that we're well over the 7650 so these are just here to say that even in our in our in our, our, our dialed down as far as we can um, we're still over the uh, uh, over the replenishment yield okay 
So, um, model run number three. We've run two models, okay? Um, we've identified these next three runs as, as what the board would like to see. Um, so, in all three runs, you're going to see I've got start of management action January 2021. Technically, uh, this is a, 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 a special counsel Markman direction. Special counsel Markman has said, and, and the board has agreed, this is where we're headed, is that it would be the earliest of an approved GSP or January 2022 or not later. Our feeling is we may not have an approved GSP by January 22, so we've started our modeling runs January 2022. Okay, that's why that's there. Um, for this model run, this is the white paper run. Yeah, the white paper management run. Now, there's been some discussion back and forth. Should we run it? Should we not? There was, a, there was a request early on to run it. When we actually talked with the allocation group, there was a hesitation to run it. There was, a, there was, a, there was even a request that maybe we ought to modify it. Let's have an ad hoc committee meeting and talk about modifying the, the, uh, the white paper run. Um, uh, just to be transparent, um, I brought those up with the, with the group and said, we're more than willing to sit down and talk about a modification. And the result was, uh, we have the white paper run. It's discussion paper, really, but we'll call it. Um, we have the discussion paper information. We have it submitted. Uh, we want you to run it. If we don't run it, then we'll never know what it says. We need to run it now. They may want to run something else later, but we need to run it so we know what it says. So we said, okay, we'll do that. So that's why we're running this one. 2022 through 2029, total pumping. It's a little different than the white paper because we're actually using current pumping right now, and I think the white paper might have been a little different than that. Um, but we're saying that nothing changes. In other words, we defer action um, for 10 years. Is that 10 years? Should be 10 years. 10 years. We defer action for 10 years. We don't do anything but allow continued pumping. Then 2030 through 2039, another for 10 years. Oh, yeah, because we count 2022. Uh, reduce pumping by equal increments each year to reach the 7650, get it down to replenishment yield. And then from then on out, we pump at the 7650. And then we evaluate. And this one, we're going to run water levels, water quality, shallow well impacts, loss of basin storage. We are going to run water quality TDS stuff on this. So this is the one we're going to do the most work on. It's sort of like your, you talk about bookends as our baseline. So we're going to run this. It is, if this one is, is that DRI? DRI has it? They have it. They got it last Tuesday. Was it last Tuesday or this Tuesday? It was last Tuesday. A week ago, too. Yeah, it was last, a week ago, Tuesday, I think. So they've got it. We should be seeing some results. Steve, just quickly, this is actually not the schedule in the white paper, by the way. That's on there. Okay. The, the white paper is a little bit different than this. It, it actually has the pumping from 2030 to 2039 ramps down to 11,000 acre feet yeah. per year. Yeah. Um, which was the upper bounds of reasonable estimates of yep. safe yield okay. or sustainable yield. Okay. And then there was, if needed, another 10 years of ramp down to 7650. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we just ramped it down to to the 7650. Um, so anyway, that's the, that's the model run we're running. We should have results soon. Um, I'll tell you, the, I'll give you the next model run. Uh, this is the coordinated ag pumping with allocation transfers. Um, as long as, you know, everybody's got somewhat of a sense of humor still, I hope. Um, at the allocation meetings, um, uh, Special Counsel Markman called this the Water for Peace run. So this one basically is try to allow an amount of pumping and try to have ag work together so that they can continue to operate for a certain number of years. Um, but but it's, very, it's still very aggressive. It's more, aggr I'll say it's more aggressive than the implementation plan I put together to try to ramp pumping down. So, same start of management action, January 2022. 2022, pumping includes reduced pumping for unprotected allocation uh, plus protected pumping. Um, this is based upon an extension of the Federal Reserve rights to roughly 86% of the domestic um, water supplies. Um, also protected are, is the city of Ridgecrest pumping um, de minimis is protected, and um, Trona, um, Cyril's uh, Municipal, is protected. Everything else is ramped down um, from starting with the first ramp down in 2022. 2023 to 27, unprotected allocations are reduced by equal increments each year um, to, to result in a total of pumping, which includes all of the Federal Reserve right pumping and the exclusions that we said, the protected pumping. 
um, with all of that, and we ramped everybody else down to a total of about 12,000 acre feet of pumping. It's not a fixed number. It's kind of an arbitrary number. The idea was there's a reasonable comfort level of assuming that we ought to be able to get somewhere between four and 6,000 acre feet of imported water in a reasonable amount of time through a combination of a, of a partnership banking program with the city of Los Angeles and possibly an exchange of uh, water supplies, state water project supplies um, with LADWP. Maybe between the two of them, we could average, long-term average, somewhere between four to 6,000 acre feet. Right now, with recycled water, we've got a supply of about 8,000 acre feet, so 4,000 gets us to 12. So that's where it came from. Um, so we ramped pumping down to about 12,000. Recycled water was available to help reduce the overdraft. Then from 2028 through 2030, we pump at that rate. So we overpump. This is the model run running. We overpump uh, for our about 8,000 acre feet a year. We overpump um, through, through 2070. Um, 2035 through 70. Oh, excuse me. That's 20 through 2070. I don't know if that should be 70 or 35. Anyway, in 2035, we assume imported water comes into play at about 4,000 acre feet in the model. Now, whether or not that imported water is directly delivered or put into replenishment, we would adjust pump. We're going to adjust pumping at, to reflect that. So, if we replenish the basin, we would continue pumping from the same wells. If we directly deliver, we turn pumping off at selected wells who would take the direct delivery water, which is what we did in model run number one and two. So, you said uh, you're assuming four to six thousand acre feet of imported augmented water. Actually four, yeah, but we're hoping for four to six, yeah. Okay, and then what did you say recycled water was? Is it 2,000 acres? No, it's totally 2,000, but for real use, it's a couple hundred acre feet. Right. Yeah. All oh, right. A couple hundred. So it's no. assuming to continue supporting the ecological to each other in the golf course. Yeah, and, and possibly a little more because they are upgrading the plant to a tertiary plant, so there may be some additional water. Yeah. Cyril's may get some of that, but yeah, it'll be in there. The more details of these model runs, you'll see individual when we get them out. Yeah, you can't really expect recycled water to grow because there's going to be more right. push on conservation. Yeah, yeah, yes, there will be. So that's model run number two, number four. Actually, our number two, but it's number four. Uh, the last model run is... Um, and and we, we were told to run it. This is not my idea. We were told to run it. This is the immediate action. Some people call it the nuclear option. They call it all, everything they want to call it. But basically this option says management starts, the action starts in January 22. Basically it says one way or another um, we, we follow all ag to zero uh, in the first year. Okay? Uh, whether it's a negotiated um, um, uh, purchase of, of ag land, whether it's a condemnation action or whatever they do, um, the attorneys all talk about this is an attorney's run, basically. This isn't a, a technical run. This isn't a water resources manager run. But they want to see what happens. We think we kind of know um, what will happen. Um, it, it won't be down to uh, the safe yield, uh, the, the replenishment yield of 7650 or 8000 It won't be there. But you folks know we did run, uh, just as a test run with DRI, we did run what happens if in the first year we, we, we take pumping down to 7650? What happens to the basin? It was a test run. It provided good information as to how the basin might react if we only take out what we think is the, is the replenishment yield. So this will be similar to that, but pumping is going to be higher than that because just taking out ag doesn't get us down that far. But anyway, that's what the run is. Total pumping is actually about 10,000 acre feet. It shows what it includes. Um, recycle water available just like before. And then we run it through, uh, 35 through um, 2070. 2070 uh, we augment with imported water the same way. Is if we're gonna if we're gonna run it with a replenishment, then we continue to pump those wells. If we direct deliver, then we turn the pumps the wells off. Uh, that they would get the imported imported water, and we evaluate the impacts. These last two runs, we evaluate all impacts except we do not evaluate uh, water quality, and that's because of cost. Uh, we don't want to run a TDS run on water quality for the last two runs, which would be the water for peace and the nuclear run. We don't want to run water quality on those until we get closer to what we think is an implementation plan, which we may run uh, uh, would be model run number six 
another run, and that one we would run everything, including water quality. So um, I think that's it. So the last thing I want to do is schedule. I, I kind of briefly mentioned it already. Um, we've been put on the hot seat to get these going and get them done, get them done. Um, we are looking at the board meeting on the 16th coming up. There will be a closed session. It will be after the meeting, not before the meeting, as I understand it. Um, we expect to have very, very preliminary, nothing definitive, very, very preliminary results for all three runs for the board to look at there, but no decisions are anticipated to be made. Uh, the board wanted an update as to where we are, and they also want an update to know uh, from Jim Markman as to where he is with the allocation group. So we'll do that in closed session. One of the, some of the things we will have with the model runs we expect will be simple things like, um, okay, how, for each of the three model runs, and you can, we can almost, I mean, Anthony, you could do it on the back, or Andy, you could do it on the back of an app. You, we could probably figure this out. But how much water does each alternative for 2023? 22 to 2070, how much net water is taken out of storage between the three different runs? You could probably do it. We can do it on the back of that. But we're going to have the model to tell us that. Um, we might have some information on. We likely will have some information on impacts to individual water well, individual wells, hydrographs for wells in each of the areas, like we've done before. We'll probably have that information. Um, impacts to shallow wells, we probably won't have. Um, so real qualitative results, we won't won't have. Um, but we'll have some very general information for them to think about. Um, Jim will probably provide a, an update on where they're at. And then the board may, there's a discussion, the board may schedule a special board meeting. Um, we would just have a closed session to bring in the final results uh, before the next TAC meeting so that uh, the final results and the board direction from those final results can be presented at your next TAC meeting which I said at the beginning, that was our goal. So, <laughs> I think I got it all. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry for taking so long. Um, I know you're tired, that was the idea. <laughs> but I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right. Go ahead, members of the uh, Can I go go first ahead, committee. Please. Okay, so I'll start with question one, I'll move to question 57. <laughs> <laughs> um, my first general comment is, the model runs that you're being asked to do. And obviously, even in the opening slide, the, the, what the attorneys are discussing are allocations of essentially a safe field on a per acre foot per year basis. Yes. Um, and that is not how Sigma is supposed to work. What we should be analyzing, if we were complying with Sigma, was what are the water levels at which we see significant and unreasonable, undesirable results in areas of the basin? And then what is the pumping that can be sustained in those areas to avoid those significant un and unreasonable results? That is, stay above the minimum threshold. Right. And we, we've, he, what we're doing is, is allocating the outcome rather than determining how we should comply with Sigma. And that's exactly what I described. We're going to have a job ahead of us to... to uh, develop the technical support around the solution that we get. Yes, we will. So, so, so that, I mean, that's my overriding comment. Yep. And it wasn't a question, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, and I think we just need to get, while the lawyers are caught up in doing allocations, mm -hmm. what the technical aspects of this project, or the technical people involved in this project should be about how we comply with Sigma. Yep. And how we set minimum thresholds yep. that prevent, that, or, at which we believe there will be no yep. significant, un unreasonable, undesirable results, yep. and then what pumping can be sustained in various areas of the basin yep. to avoid hitting that minimum threshold. I understand. So that's my just. I, I, I absolutely understand, Anthony, and that's part of the big reason why I put those impasse factors in because they're not part of, yeah. of of Sigma. I recognize that, but they are driving a lot of our discussion right now. So. Yep. So then on, on to slide four. <laughs> um, I had a question. It is a question, and, and Stefan may even be able to answer it. Some time ago, there was a discussion about whether the base had a turnout from the aqueduct yes. that was available for emergency purposes. Is that the question? That's a question. The base used to have a connection. Uh, my understanding is the connection to the aqueduct is, is likely still there as, as an outlet, but it's, it's not connected to the base anymore. 
Um, but it is one that we consider, we've considered as a potential, potential use of that connection going forward. Yeah. And, and but, so, it, but it's not the like, the pipeline was taken out. Okay. Oh, it's still there. It's it's not. It's probably it's not usable. It's yeah, probably I, I was told it was gone, so I didn't. Maybe it, gone was. If it is there, it is not functional in any way. Stretch. Oh, it blew yeah. apart. Yeah. So, so so related question. Yeah. When that turnout was put into the aqueduct, was there any agreement between the federal government and the city of Los Angeles that controls the use of that turnout? It was wartime years. It was it was done with a. Uh, priority project basis, no doubt. So the question would be, if we're in an emergency and the base needs more water, yeah. could they use that turnout? They couldn't yeah. get water to the base right now. But oh, I, no, but they would have to put the infrastructure. Yes. Yeah. I don't know. The don't original know the base was Harvey Field in Inukern. There was never any water to the current facility. But it could be used, maybe. Well, it's 10 miles more. Yeah, but they could put that in. Surely, yeah, that's, but that's, I'm just saying, you, you, there, you, yeah. talking about the original facility, doesn't, there, there's no significance to that. It's more what, the, what kind of agreements might be made. Yeah. But that was wartime. That yeah. was the desperation I, years of World War II. Maybe to shortcut that even, Anthony, our discussions with Capital Corps, they've already met and talked with the base, and they will be continuing to coordinate base support for whatever whatever water supply we try to get. So that is a, a key part of their, their, their assignment, yes. Yeah, I was just hoping there might have been an agreement yeah, yeah. in place yeah. back no, in our, 1942 or whatever that said. Yeah. Our eyes, when I heard about that connection, our eyes lit up. We thought we had found it, but no, it didn't work out that way. If I may interrupt really quickly, I just want to let everybody know, we're almost to 5 o'clock, and we're only still at item number 3 in our agenda. And uh, the PAC is coming at 6 o'clock. And so some of you who are going to that, you might like to get some dinner. Other yeah. things of that nature. So just a reminder. So your other 57 questions, you're going to have to hold on. Please continue. 54 <laughs> now? Um, so so I, I won't go into the details because we can deal with those at some other venue. But um, I guess, the, you know, I think what would be interesting to see from the different model runs is the relative effects on water levels in the different areas. Um, which, which, well, which is really the critical element. No, no, I know, yes, I know. I think that's, that's an important that. to see. You'll see that. Um, and how, but again, what significant and unreasonable undesired results are being mitigated or being avoided by that incremental difference sure. in the different runs? Sure. Because if, if there is a difference, say, under one model run, it shows that there's a water level decline over the next 20 years, say, of the implementation period for the GSP. Uh, of 30 feet, and in a more stringent model run, it's 25 feet. What's significant and reasonable undesired results being caused by that incremental five foot? So, so that that's you know that relative comparison sure. stuff. Is it triggering triggering an undesirable result? Because yeah. um, I think even if you stopped pumping in one area of the basin, which may mitigate some concern, whatever that concern might be in that area. Say, for example, the, while you can't quantify it now, there might be concern about private domestic wells in that area. It won't do anything for the private domestic wells that are proximate to the other area of pumping right. in that 20-year time frame. Yeah. Hydrology doesn't react that quick. Right. <laughs> so, so mitigating one area isn't going to help you mitigating another. Anthony, can I, can I ask you something real quick related to that? Are you suggesting that somehow we could identify those thresholds in the model and back calculate? And so, in other words, we model those thresholds and back calculate what the pumping rates would be at various areas in the valley? That's what Sigma is supposed to do. Yes, but you're supposed you to saying, set thresholds in different areas of the basin. Yeah, is that is that a feasible option to do with the model? Is that easily done? No, it's not. It's what being done in every other basin I'm working in. That's why the models are going forward the way they are. They're attempts to discover uh, the exact thing that Sigma is requiring, um, but approaching it from the other direction. The models are all designed to work basically just like their, like ModFlow is being used here. That's the way it works. But I, but I think the difference is, is which wells we're going to use to set these sustainable indicators, 
that that hasn't been done with the previous results that we've seen. You've, you've sort of picked some random wells, no, but not random. They're the same no. wells that I showed here, but not all the wells. But they weren't just shallow, intermediate, deep. We need to we need to be a little more detailed on that, and that'll happen. And there's so. no threshold set. Right. Can I get you to run up to the microphone real quick, Jean? I don't see that we're having a problem with, with the Sigma method by the method that we're doing at all. I don't have a problem with it. That's all. It gets back to my argument as to, you know, if you stop pumping in some area, does that really negate a significant unreasonable undesirable result? Or is it just we're being malicious and want those people to stop pumping? And is it then arbitrary and capricious? It creates, that, it creates a water market without any new water. Not one drop. Well, the market only works if there's someone willing to sell. I'm sure we have plenty of buyers. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we do. <laughs> but I don't think in this basin we're going to have anything to sell. During the ramp down, there should be some... <laughs> Some water, but it's, it's maybe not. someone might decide it's better to sell than use. Yeah, but that that might be it. Yep. In the long run, yep. without imported water, yep. you know, <laughs> there's not going to be water to sell. Yep. Internal versus external. All right then. So, Gene, just just so I'm clear, you envision at some point once the modeling is done, we've sort of identified all the key wells we're going to use. There'll be some analysis done to kind of cons you know compare observed versus simulated, yeah. and then also check that against reality. Yeah, yeah. we're, we're going to have to go through all of that. I mean, our next yeah. step, Eddie, really is to get direction, show the board what what it bottled in, and then get direction from the board. But ultimately, there's going to have to be a tactic. We're going to have to write a GSP around this somewhere, right. and, and and we do have a tack, and you guys are going to be involved in that. So. And I don't want my comments to appear as criticism for what Stats is doing. Yeah. I think you're doing a great job. I don't. I don't you, you have got one or task that, to yeah. be honest, I'm quite glad I'm not yeah. having to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm having to do it elsewhere, and it's bad enough. I know. Yeah. But, so I you're know. doing a great job. Yeah, no. Uh, just one, one question in terms of what you're going to be presenting to the board. Are you going to be presenting the costs of the different options and potential schedule? Because the different uh, roads you're going to go down with these different options are not going to be turning off the pumps right away, is my is in my view. I mean, you, you know, because <laughs> it's going to it may require condemnation or yes. acquisition yes. and litigation. And yes. what are the associated costs and yes. timing for that? Is yeah. it going to be five or ten yes. years? And when you start comparing that to trying to do some other kind of ramp down. How does it how does it pencil out? Yeah, that that's more on. To, I mentioned there was two paths, and one of them was the special counsel Markman with the board. Um, they are following that path with with special counsel at the last board meeting. For those that were here, um, the board did authorize um, the general manager at Water District to uh, search out and retain a, uh, a qualified appraiser, land appraiser. Discover. Uh the exact thing that Sigma is requiring, uh, but approaching it from the other direction. The models are all designed to work basically just like they're, like mod flow is being used here. That's the way it works. But I, but I think the difference is, is which wells we're going to use to set these sustainable indicators. That, that hasn't been done with the previous results that we've seen. You've, you've sort of picked some random wells, but... But they weren't just shallow, intermediate, deep. We need to we need to be a little more detailed on that, and that'll happen. So. Right.
Can I get you to run up to the microphone real quick, Jean? Um, I don't see that they're having a problem with the particular method by the method that we're doing at all. I don't have a problem with it. That's all. But it gets back to my argument as to, you know, if you stop pumping in some area, does that really negate a significant unreasonable undesirable result? Or is it just we're being malicious and want those people to stop pumping? And is it then arbitrary and capricious? It, that, creates, it creates a water market without any new water. Not one drop. The market only works if there's someone willing to sell. I'm sure we have plenty of buyers. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we do. <laughs> but I don't think in this basin we're going to have anything to sell. During the ramp down, there should be some, <laughs> some, some water. but it's, it's Maybe. Not. Someone might decide it's better to sell than use. Yeah. But that, that might be it. Yeah. In the long run, yep. without imported water, yep. you know, <laughs> there, there's not going to be water to sell. Yeah. Internal versus external. All right, then. So, Gene, just, just so I'm clear, you envision at some point, once the modeling is done, we've sort of identified all the key wells we're going to use. There'll be some analysis done to kind of, you know, compare observed versus simulated, yeah. and then also check that against reality. So. Yeah, we're, we're going to have to go through yeah. all of that. I mean, our next yeah. step, Eddie, really is to get direction, show the board what, what it modeled in, and then mm -hmm. get direction from the board. But ultimately, there's going to have to be a tactic. We're going to have to write a GSP around this somewhere. Right. And, and, and we do have a TAC, and you guys are going to be involved in that. So. And I don't want my comments to appear as criticism for what Stats is doing. Yeah. I think you're doing a great job. I don't. I don't you, you have got one or a task that, to yeah. be honest, I'm quite glad I'm not yeah. having to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm having to do it elsewhere, and it's bad enough. I know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you're doing a great job. Yeah, no. Uh, just one, one question in terms of what you're going to be presenting to the board. Are you going to be presenting the costs of the different options and potential schedule? because the different uh, roads you're going to go down with these different options are not going to be turning off the pumps right away, is my, is in my view. I mean, you, you know, because it's gonna, it may require condemnation yeah. or acquisition yeah. and litigation. And yeah. what are the associated costs and yeah. timing for that? Is yeah. it going to be five or ten yeah. years? And when you start comparing that to trying to do some other kind of ramp down, how does it how does it pencil out? Yeah, that that's more on. To, I, I mentioned there was two paths, and one of them was the special counsel Markman with the board. Um, they are following that path with the, with special counsel at the last board meeting. For those that were here, um, the board did authorize um, the general manager of water district to uh, search out and retain a, uh, a qualified appraiser, land appraiser. So they're starting that direction to get that. And the answer is that doesn't mean they're going that way. The, dec the decision was, oh, we need to know what we need to know. So they need to go out there and find that information. So they're going that direction too. So those costs, Jim Markman has provided litigate estimates of litigation costs. They're not cheap. Yeah. Um, they're all being discussed, but I'm not, that's really, that's where I get to be there, but I'm not, inv I'm not involved in that. Yeah, I just, I just want to. Yes, um, that's all in there. Yeah, and, and the estimate of storage in the basin. Yeah. Other things. Yeah. These are good comments and also questions that the PAC is also going to be discussing as well. I had one, one no. last question for Steve. Do you think the board gets the ideas behind sustainable management criteria versus the focus is on this bigger sustainable, sustainable yield numbers? Do you think they get, do you think they get it? I, uh, I'll my, answer it. I don't think they do. Some of them do. I, I honest, my honest answer is, yeah, I think they do. Okay. I think that they, um, we, they, we, we got some really, really smart guys on the board. Right. They really are smart guys. And, um, and I respect them a lot. And um, I think they get it. They, but we told them, we've walked through what we're, what we were headed, we were headed technical approach. We mm -hmm. were headed model runs one and two and looking for number three. And we were headed that way. And we got, we got diverted a little bit. Um, and, they convinced me that they're, they understand what we were doing and where we were headed and that they, they were um, um, consciously giving us direction based upon the way they felt the, they as a board, mm -hmm. all of them together as a board agreed we should go. And they are basically, and I'm just, I'm just gonna say it because this is, 
you know, I've, 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 I've been going through this a lot in my own mind as I go through it too. But like if I lived in the community, if I didn't, you know, try and do the right thing, we're engineers, we try to solve problems, mm -hmm. that's what we do. But a lot of times we don't solve them in our own backyard. You know, I try to put myself in this position and, you know, the position that they're expressing, which I totally understand, I get it, um, is that they want to make sure and they're not sure uh, they can right now, at least in this first draft of the GSP, they're not sure. They want to make sure there's an adequate water supply for their kids, their grandkids, and their kids going forward. For their kids, their grandkids, and their kids going forward. And the idea of taking water out of reserve storage without an assured supply of imported water doesn't work for them right now. Mm -hmm. that's, as, that's as clear as it is right now. And okay. you know, I've bounced it around in my head, and I get it. Um, on the technical side, I know that we can put together technical plans that go exactly what Anthony described. We can do that. But I get this side of it too, and that's where I think they are. Okay. okay. Yeah, I just I just see a lot of, you know, acre feet per year numbers being thrown out, but I don't see a, a, a big discussion or heavy discussion about okay, key wells and you know how are we going to manage these different areas? We're going to get there. Yeah. We we will get there. I think. I mean, I look at the imported water as, as somewhat of a binary issue. Yeah. Either you have it or you don't. Yes. And if you don't have it, then there's not much you can do to avoid the loss in storage. Here. Correct. And it's, it will be irreversible for the foreseeable future, not yes. decades, but centuries. Yes. Well, we're, well so. that, that's why we've assumed, we've made the assumption in our modeling, 2035 seemed like a reasonable goal. We should know long before then whether we're on track or not. If we don't get there at 2035, we have five-year updates that have to be done to the GSP. I would assume that well before 2035, you know, more adjustments would have to be made if, if imported water doesn't show, I, w it, just to be in compliance with DWR. Yeah. And okay. once you, one, on the, the opposite binary side, if you do have it, it just, it's then just an economic exercise. Yeah. Correct. It's who can afford to buy it at that price. Absolutely correct. And if I may I interrupt really quick, uh, this would be a good opportunity to send these as emails also <laughs> as good information to give to Stetson sure. that they will provide sure. to the GA board so but, that we can move on to our next step yeah, as well. We can do it. Any more comments on this one? Shh, don't ask that. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, now to the public. Oh, boy. Judy Decker, I think uh, the message that Steve Johnson just gave us is a very sad commentary on our Groundwater Authority board and their faith in the technical advisory committee that they appointed. And I think it's even more sad that they would choose to do all this discussion of this item in closed session and not reveal it to the public that comes to their meeting, the stakeholders who may or may not have elected them and whom they serve. Thank you. Dave Janice, PAC Chair. Looks like I won't get any dinner either. Uh, real quick question for clarity, since we're not going to have Steve for our meeting, and uh, in reading the attorney summary from that last meeting, the statement is made that the two runs referred to in the attorney's letter will be run in the model scenarios. And I don't see the first one, which is the forcing function uh, model proposed to be run. Uh, the allocation looks a little bit like number four, but it doesn't match up. Can you confirm that it is number four and it's just the general differences yeah. uh, and lack of clarity that? that you referred to it, it is, is number it four is number four yes so that's the peace for or yeah. water for peace option and the yes. other one i recognize as the nuclear option absolutely correct okay yeah. so we can have that discussion with the pack tonight yes Thanks. you can yeah jim put that together and sometimes the attorney puts the the technical stuff, how we're going to model it together a little bit different but but we're on the yeah. same track it's yes. more specific in some areas and less in others i agree I thank agree. you yeah. heather fixed it I, I just wanted to respond to judy decker's question thank you uh, david is that okay I mean, I, I do look at it as a bit of a slap in the face. I know a lot of us spent quite a bit of time and effort looking at these scenarios, and, and I do think it's unfortunate that that's, this is in the outcome. I, I hope it doesn't set a precedent for other things that come through the TAC, because now, now that, that 
that has been established that that's okay because you might get a little pushback from the TAC and, and maybe Adam and others might have to be a little more vocal because again, you know, this TAC has, has got registered professionals, educated folks, but now it seems like some of these decisions are made, you know, um, I, I would say by non-technical folks. So I just hope that that's not a, a precedent to what, what's to come. So that's just a comment. Yeah, I wasn't going to make a comment, but uh, Eddie, I, I think what you just pointed out is um, it really needs to be passed on to the board. And we will do it personally, but uh, there is a process and the public involvement is primarily through the two committees. And to the extent that's being short-circuited here, it's not good. Okay. If that is all set for item number three, then we will go ahead and move on to uh, the last two items here, three items actually. One, number four, future agenda items. This is simply for the uh, upcoming May TAC meeting. We have the items listed here, uh, similar. June. This, or excuse me, we're in May. We're in May. For the June. Yeah, it says May on. So it right. does. So that was a typing thing. Uh, we still have sustainable management actions on the modeling scenarios, data gap information, yep. monitoring network, minimum thresholds and measurable objectives, interim milestones, undesirable results. These are important within the management criteria. Yep. That will continue on. Yep. And then implementation options as well. Yep. Any additional changes, of course, those that are required by the board or those that are uh, suggested or given to us, I'm sure that Stevie will be made aware and that yep. we will update and change that. Uh, future times for the meetings, June 6th, and then the July timing will be June 27th, and then, of course, August will be within August, August 1st. Okay, that was item number five, by the comments way. Comments on 405? Uh, normally, we don't usually need them. Just, just before the discussion we had earlier today. Sure. <laughs> um, we would volunteer, uh, should the TAC have interest, to... Um, provide a presentation on the direction of the Brackish Water Group as the work in that group is accelerating. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be an opportune time to explain to those parties who have an interest in the, the groundwater in this space and what that group has been doing and what it plans to do in the coming months and years. That actually would have been great as part of item number six, okay. but we'll accept that because that does sound like a good idea. Okay, so we'll jump to item number six. Uh, any other announcements or comments? I have none. Okay, have none. and then we'll go to uh, members of the committee, and I'll start over on the way far side. Earl, go ahead. It's time for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Earl. We appreciate that comment. Agreed. <laughs> Thank you, Don. Don number two. <laughs> nothing. Okay. Thank you. Eddie? I was just going to sort of make a, a, a suggestion or a request. Um, would we want to have well, well Intel come in and share some of this? I mean, it'll be about two months worth of domestic well data that they've been collecting. Would it, would it be worth having them come to the next TAC just to kind of highlight some of that information? I mean, I know it's, it's not a long duration they've collected, but just to sort of showcase what they're seeing. Um, what, what's thoughts on that? We can, we can have them send it to us and see what, what he's got. Yeah, you know, maybe we should look at it first. Yeah, time. look yeah. at it first. Yeah. But sure. Yeah. I think Well sure. Intel is going to be presenting something at the GA board meeting, aren't they? They're giving an update on how well the last month has been going. So yeah, uh, yeah. I think, I think this is additional discussion. opportunity for them to come and also sure. present to the TAC as well. Sure. Okay, that's just, your recommendation. I think so. I mean, just okay. to kind of dive into it a little bit more, the GA to be kind of limited on what they can show, you know, okay. and timing. That's good. Thank you. I have no comments at this time. Just beyond what I said before, Go ahead, uh, for, the, for the Brackish Group, we are actually giving a presentation to the Water District Board on May 13th at 6 p.m., so those that want a sneak preview of what might be given here two weeks later are obviously welcome to attend that. Okay. Yeah, I will be missing the next uh, TAC meeting. I'll be at the June 5th and 6th GSA Summit in Fresno and uh, helped organize that. And uh, I'll uh, send a, a program along to Adam. Just a reminder that there are scholarships available to pay for the $565 fee for members of the community and committee. 
And then uh, the other thing is that uh, we, we, uh, we did issue a draft HCM report that was uh, produced under the Brackish Water Project and in conjunction with the Stanford Project. We, uh, I guess we'll ask for any comments from the TAC by May 17th. Um, and then uh, just a reminder that the, uh, the uh, second phase of that is starting up and that we will get, uh, we will, that, and that second phase is doing a geostatistical distribution of uh, texture and hydraulic conductivity for the model. The other thing is I think I'd like to uh, follow up with you. Uh, is it John Bacon? No. Steve, Steve. Steve Bacon, sorry. Uh, and and uh, because it, it may be uh, useful to uh, incorporate your uh, surface, surficial uh, mapping into this because uh, we, did, we were not able to extend very far into the Navy base, which it looked like you mapped quite a bit of inf uh, anyway. Uh, so uh, that's pretty much it. Thanks. Okay. Well, I don't think I have any comments. Thank you all. Okay. All right. If there are no okay, comments, back to question through. 22, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> so do I have a motion to so finish moved. up with what we're doing? So moved. There's a first. How about a second? Second. second. Motion done. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Go get some food and then come on back for the other.